uh, you invent uh, or probably derive by graph theoretical computations or systematic searches of all graphs um, that, um, that has a certain classical property property because then once you get this uh, structure of, of quantum observers you try to force upon them a classical interpretation yeah you say uh, um, if uh, say a starting point of my graph is let's say one then the end point of my graph yeah has to be uh, has to be one as well has to be the value one as well yeah so this is a state dependent argument um, um, and this is often called um, this is often called Hardy type. Hardy didn't invent that. That's a uh, that's a, a typical example of Stiglitz's law of uh, eponymy. But um, uh, it was actually Kochen and Specker who who, uh, who utilized these, and uh, many people followed them suit. Um, so the idea is you got compounds of quantum observables that you force, on, on which you force a classical interpretation and you say, uh, you have some relational information. If this is true, then this must be true or this must be false and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, um, and, and, then, and then you try uh, to do the experiments and try to, um, uh, to contradict uh, the classical predictions, yeah. And if the classical predictions, let, let's say if you assume, well, if this is you prepare a particle in that state and you measure it in another state and you have in mind, you know, but this is only, this is an idealistic argument. You have in mind that all those intermediate, uh, which are counterfactual observers exist in your mind and also in reality. Uh, and if uh, this has a classical interpretation, then the outcome uh, must also always be that way. And you look at the outcome, so you prepare it, yeah, uh, and then you measure it, yeah. And, and when the measurement uh, is not uh, according to your classical interpretation, then you say, oh, this has to be quantized because it is um, corroborated, of course, not proven, but corroborated by the, the quantum predictions. And in all the cases we have seen so far, uh, uh, the quantum predictions um, have not been falsified, to speak with Popper. Yeah? Uh, but the classical predictions have been falsified. So you assume that this is a good thing and you call that uh, contextuality. Yeah? <clears throat> So these are these are two um, two types um, that that are based basically on probabilistic arguments or on arguments that are directly related to um, a classical value definiteness. Um, but then, but then you have also a, a situation where you get something that is even more weird, you know, and, and Koshen and Specker already in the, in this, in the famous, uh, in their famous 67 uh, paper uh, had, an, had an example of that. And I will shortly, uh, in a short time, I will show you this example. Um, the idea there is that not only you get probabilistic, um, probabilistic uh, differences uh, between uh, mm -hmm predictions, uh, classical predictions and quantum predictions and quantum mechanics is, is corroborated, uh, but you, you, you get the structure of quantum observables that are beyond classical embeddability. Yeah, um, th that is, uh, you get um, two valued states more formally uh, uh, um, expressed, you get two valued states that are insufficient uh, to use them um, uh, to generate a faithful classical Im embedding into, into a, a larger Boolean algebra. In the previous examples, uh, there are many examples, let's say um, uh, the, the examples I mentioned with the true implies false and true implies true, um, 
graphs or hypergraphs uh, th that still can be embedded um, in a larger Boolean algebra. But um, you get also graphs or hypergraphs which um, uh, which are totally where it is totally impossible to embed them in a larger Boolean algebra and at the same time uh, maintain the algebraic relations. So the a homomorphic embedding you cannot do that. Yeah, and the criterion is. The criterion of Coach and Specker, I will I will show that in a second, is that you that the set of two valued states is separating. That is, uh, for any two atoms, you you get at least uh, two two states uh, where those atoms have different values. Yeah, and of course uh, you get a very strong form of uh, contextuality, the strongest possibly the strongest. Uh, uh, possible form of contextuality where you don't have any kind of consistent with with respect or relative to the assumptions you make a consistent uh, um, uh, um, a classical interpretation of these observables. That is, there is no way how you can associate uh, falsehood and truth to those observables. Uh, because uh, because any any attempt to do that results in a complete contradiction, you know, results in a complete contradiction. That doesn't mathemat in mathematical terms. There is no two-valued state on such structures. Yeah, no classical two-valued state uh, interpre interpretable as classical truth assignment. So uh, let me let me just. Um, uh, summarize this again in what what we actually do here from a, from a tactical point of view. Yeah, you first take a suitable bag of observables that you take from somewhere. Let, let's assume you take them from quantum mechanics, but you can also take them from automaton logic, partition logic, or whatever. Yeah, but usually people are interested in quantum observables, so they take these uh, these observables from uh, from quantum mechanics. Uh, you take them in a bag, you know, and they are somehow connected, you know, intertwining. And then you interpret them classically and you have your classical predictions, mostly in terms of uh, convex combinations of extreme cases. And then you interpret them quantum mechanically and have your quantum probabilities, which are uh, vector space based, yeah, based on, on, on vectors. And then, if you are lucky, uh, you, there is a discrepancy between the classical and the quantum predictions. You know, and you and you realize you quantize the system. You realize these observers, measure them one after another, and and um, and if those uh, if there is a discrepancy, mm, um, you can be quite sure that um, that quantum mechanics prevails. Yeah. Or at least is is not ruled out. Let's say, uh, let's say very cautiously with uh, with Karl Popper. Um, there are three important issue issues here with this kind of arguments that that one needs to keep in mind. The first is, um, which is a very interesting formal point of view. Once given uh, such a bag of observables. Uh, uh, and once given certain reasonable um, reasonable conditions um, on these observables, such that for, ev for every maximal observable, for every observable that are uh, that, that are co-measurable, you need to have some classical probability uh, theory on them. This is basically this additivity for a co-measurable observables is probably the most the strongest condition uh, you have. Um, uh, th then the question is, what kind of probabilities? I mean, in purely functional terms, what kind of probabilities can can you can you do on them? You know, uh, we uh, I will I will show you uh, an example um, uh, what what I have in mind here. Um, so so th this is the question. What kind of, given uh, a bag of, of observables, what kind of probability is possible on these observables? You know, this, 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 need not, this may go beyond, uh, beyond uh, the, the quantum ones. Yeah? There may be weirder ones out there that, that may be 
uh, that may be um, realizable or thinkable. And, and maybe we find uh, situations where, where uh, we have this weirder kind of uh, quantum behavior. But uh, we, the, the intuition is really this classically um, quantum um, analogy. Um, and 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 then the, and then of course you may ask well if there is such arbitrary, arbitrariness um, why is why are certain things so and not the other way you know and and um, the answer to that is that one and the same structure of observers might have very very different uh, uh, resources and very different realizations. And I came through that by studying automaton logic and generalized Wynn models that were invented by, uh, by Wright um, and, um, and, and compared them to uh, classic, uh, to quantum observables. And for finite uh, bags of observables, uh, those are not very different, but they have, they have uh, when you realize them, they have very different probability distributions. So this is a very interesting, fascinating subject on its own. Let, let me give you some anecdotal example. Uh, let's say um, this is usually called a pentagon or a pentagram, you know, uh, depending on your preferences. Uh, uh, the quantum logic community um, uh, at first called them the house diagram. This was Kalmbach. Kalmbach called uh, this, uh, this the house diagram, just consists of uh, five uh, cyclically um, interlinked, um, intertwining contexts. And um, and um, uh, and you have you have a classical interpretation uh, in terms of convex combinations uh, of the eleven. There are eleven two valued states there on, uh, or, or I should say, not two valued states. Eleven um, zero one states there on. Yeah. Um, which means, what is a zero one state? Well, a zero one state um, is is a state. That, that associates, let's say, uh, with one, uh, with one uh, observable in every context, a red, and all the other ones should be green, yeah? So if I associate with eight, say, a, a7 red, um, a6 and a5 should be green, and a8 and a9 should, be, should, should also be green, you know, because there can only be one red uh, on each, context, and this is a hypergraph that has been invented uh, by Grichy and others. And then you might uh, take this one and this one, and then we are almost finished because all that is left, oh, no, sorry. See, I, I did the wrong thing, that's, that's good. Sometimes mistakes are very important. So this has to be green, this has to be green. And in order to make this consistent, the only the only way how you can color this is a red. Yeah. So these are. Uh, this is just one of the eleven two-valued states that are classically allowed. And in quantum probabilities, of course, these states are realized by vectors, and then you get uh, a Born-type probabilities that have been discussed also or re-derived with certain assumptions by Gleason and has, has, has also been uh, in a totally different context developed by, uh, by Lovac. And, and then you get um, a, another type of probability which associates, I don't have the color here, but, but let, me, let me show, no. Uh, let me show them with uh, black. I have to erase that. No, I cannot some reason, yeah, here, no. Uh, so I can make these and these and these and these and these, um, uh, one half, probability one half, and, this, and these ones in the middle, probability zero. Yeah, so this is, this is uh, the, the other exotic one, but maybe there exist more, we, we just don't know. Yeah, we just don't know. It's an interesting question on its own. Okay. So far, uh, we are we are zooming in towards the end. So I, 
I will, uh, I will then, uh, I will now, so, so far we have uh, only spoken um, about uh, different probability distributions on fixed collections of intertwining observables. Now we shall be talking about weird non-classical collections of intertwined observables. Yeah? And the first example that I found in, in the literature uh, is already contained in this famous uh, paper uh, by Cochin and Specker, uh, mainly um, uh, famous um, due to this Cochin Specker theorem that says uh, there exist uh, structures of quantum observables that does, don't allow any kind of classical interpretation relative to the assumptions made. But, uh, but this one, this one, they discussed also, and this is very fascinating. They said that there exist structures of quantum observables that wouldn't allow a separation. With, with classical means. What, what does it mean? Let, let me give you uh, a preliminary uh, um, gadget type of argument. If you assume that this here is, is true and this here is true, then you get a complete contradiction. Why? Because um, this, this has to be false here. This has to be false. And then the only way you can you can associate um, a value definite observer is here and here, but this is connected, and uh, you, you shouldn't get in a single context. You should not get. You must not get two two true statements. Yeah, this is uh, this is against the assumptions. So all you can do is, and I'm erasing these value assignments now. So all you can do is. Um, uh, if if you assume that this is true, um, then uh, then this has to be false. Just just because if I assume that if a is uh, false, I get uh, is true again. Also, I get a complete contradiction as I argued before. So uh, this has to be true also. Um, um, and then. And then um, <clears throat> this has to be true also. This is a this is a meeting point. Yeah, same context. So uh, you get two um, uh, true uh, two false statements, and then you have another rule. Um, there must be at least one true statement here. So this has to be true. So um, so uh, this, if you assume that this is true, this has to be true as well. And for symmetry reasons, you could you could also um, you could also say that this and these um, uh, observers uh, cannot be um, uh, distinguished by classical means. So you have a non distinguishable non distinguishable you you cannot distinguish between um, at least two atoms. Yeah. I, uh, what, two pairs of atoms in this case. You cannot distinguish between two pairs of atoms, namely uh, this pair here and that pair here. And this is a typical case um, that, uh, that um, uh, where, where the, the, their theorem, Cochin Specker theorem zero in this work is pertinent. It says that in order to allow classical embeddability, you need a distinguishability here among A and B here, yeah? So um, um, now here do you can you can but but le let me see let me see as I mean here here uh, this A and this B should be associated with those observers here yeah so so you 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 don't have that and since you don't have that you cannot embed them. And this is a much more stringent uh, criterion than mere probabilistic differences. Yeah? These are structural algebraic differences uh, beyond uh, probability. And this is, this is why I say, uh, well, these are different examples. Uh, this is the original coach, coach Specker type, and this is a new one in four dimensions, uh, Hardy type things. And, and this is uh, how, how I argue that um, in order to assure it, that, that, that uh, a stronger form uh, of contextuality emerges from non embeddability in the sense of uh, Cochin Specker. And um, there exist many graphs who realize that, and many, 
uh, also in four dimensions. Uh, I mean, I, I discussed this in a, in a recent paper in four dimensions, how to generalize them to four dimensions. Um, um, uh, so there exist a lot of examples uh, in, in quantum mechanics, um, which not only has this probabilistic um, contextual form of contextuality, and there exist even weirder, weirder forms of uh, this type of contextuality. Uh, because, for instance, this so this graph um, that has that is based on. Um, a paper uh, on a on a dissertation of the ETH in Zürich. Oh, there are two. Uh, two. Uh, uh, well, this is not not good. It should should be one uh, one pair of dots. Um, this is this is based on a dissertation that uh, that was made um, um, under the the guidance of Professor Specker. He gave it to me personally by um, Dr. Gavadecha Seeberger, and she published, she, she based her argument on a communication by Schütte, Schütte in, in 1965. You know, he, she, Schütte gave a famous, uh, um, uh, no, no, an ingenious argument um, um, why certain uh, tautologies uh, that are classical tautologies cannot be quantum tautologies. And based on these configurations of observers, uh, Dr. Klavadecha Seeberger under, um, under, under supervision of Professor Specker uh, in Zürich um, uh, de developed uh, her dissertation. And based on this configuration, uh, Josef Katletz in Prague um, um, uh, 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 proposed uh, this bag of observers, this bag of observers here. And this has a funny property that, um, that um, uh, it, it is uh, what is called non-unital set of two-valued states. So um, uh, if you take all classical interpretations, you, you find out that the only classical interpretations that are allowed um, that the only one must have this as a as a as as true, and uh, then uh, those connected parts must be false. So all these um, so all these observers here, uh, no, sorry, they have to be true. Yeah, they have to be true because they are connected to the false observers. So so um, they cannot be true. You know, so this is uh, this is even more absurd because you if, if you prepare a state in that uh, a particle in that state and you measure that observer, those observer never must happen according to classical predictions. But of course, according to the quantum predictions, and here is a concrete uh, parameterization uh, um, by by cutlets, and according to to those uh, predictions, they occur. So so you get a complete contradiction already here. Um, and this is um, and this, and, and one can prove that. Of course, these are these are all um, these are all um, non-non-classically -discern, non discernible by classical means. So these are all non-separable, and you cannot create uh, a larger Boolean algebra that uh, that embeds all of them. So this is this is even worse. This is even worse. And then there exist uh, hypergraphs that uh, I don't know if they have a uh, class, uh, quantum interpretation, I strongly suspect that they have not, but they have um, uh, interpretation in terms of generalized win models of partition logics, which even uh, weirder, uh, which even weirder than that uh, pro probability. So we are talking about uh, 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 structures of observers that that may not occur in quantum mechanics, but uh, in generalized win models that have even weirder probably, uh, properties that um, this, this is a structure that has been proposed by Grigi in 1971 already. He calls it G32. And, um, and um, uh, what, what I draw here is uh, um, a realization in terms of, pro of uh, partition logic. And this has the probability that it is not, that it cannot be uh, colored, that the chromatic number of this, uh, of this hypergraph uh, is four. So you need four numbers. And this has some consequences on, 
on the classical realizability and on the realizability in terms of uh, properties. So you need four basic properties in order to realize such a graph. This has been discussed in a recent work by um, uh, Mohamed Sherakis and myself. And uh, this points towards an even more uh, weirder, weirder situation. So, so basically, uh, what I uh, what I want to say is before I thank you for your attention is that um, um, that contextuality uh, has many meanings. Uh, most of the time, it is um, interpreted in terms of probabilistic. Uh, uh, um, probabilistic, in probabilistic terms, but you can also uh, interpret them in in um, in algebraic terms, and this is what I want to stress here. And uh, after that statement, I thank you for your attention, and I'm finishing my talk now. Thanks, Carl. Thanks for this very nice talk, and we have uh, room for questions. So, if someone has a question, you can. Put it on the chat. I have a question myself, and someone asked a question. Uh, Carl, uh, you mentioned this sort of non separability. And at the beginning, uh, you said that um, there is a strong contextual behavior that when you uh, create a measurement context, somehow you have that uh, the properties appear related to it. Well, in the literature, uh, this has been related to non-locality, usually, so to that, that quantum mechanics has uh, an intrinsic sort of non-locality, and of course, they relate this with the Bell inequalities. But of course, there is always this tension between non-locality and contextuality. So pe some people will say, like I say that, somehow uh, quantum mechanics is contextual and not non-local. But what, what's your, your stake on that? What, what's your opinion? I would like to hear. Well, um, the, I, I believe that um, as, at least as, as I presented it here, um, those are two different uh, issues. You know, the, the one is you, you can have non-contextuality in a, in a, in, a, in a local and in a non-local uh, uh, configuration. Yeah? So if you, if you, for instance, in the typical EPR configuration, you, you have an explosion view of those observables. Yeah? And you have relational information uh, through due to the entanglement of that state. But this is not necessary. And there are, let, let me put it a little bit, uh, pointedly, let, let me say, or controversially. Uh, some people, and I don't want to say uh, who, but one might imagine that so, some people say, why don't you need uh, um, uh, non-locality if uh, this type of uh, um, contextuality is al already there? You know, you, you don't need that. On the other hand, I, I think from a physical point of view is, um, one might say mind-boggling to see that behavior even among spatially di distributed uh, subsystems, you know? So, so uh, from a pure, these are many, many times the mathematicians, they say, well, you don't need that, you know? Uh, but uh, but uh, from a physical point of view, it's fascinating because space-time, uh, you can say it's an a priori construct. I, I don't believe that. You know? I don't believe that. that. That's another issue. But but it's still it's still fascinating to see uh, some uh, some uh, some uh, di different space time points and they, they behave in a contextual fashion. You know? they, they, they cannot be separated. Yes, I see. And another question regarding just that, that theorem zero. Uh, perhaps you know them, but we've been working with uh, Desio Krause and Acacia Barros about uh, how contextuality and indistinguishability are related. It's a sort of uh, exploration, you know, we are, we, are, we are still working on that. We have the yeah. thesis that somehow uh, the fact that you have uh, properties with the same content, but that can appear in the different context, that's, that lies at, at the heart of it. 
So one possibility is that they become indistinguishable. Do you think that what, what you say here, just in this slide that you are showing, can be related to that? Uh, yeah, it may, it may be. I, I think this is a typical example where we have to go over the argument, you know, and we have to explain uh, to ourselves at some point. Yeah, it, it, I, 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 I just be very humble. I say uh, these criteria are, are out there for a long time. Uh, have been already published in this famous article uh, in this ingenious uh, constructions by Coach and Specker, and uh, they need to be taken more seriously. You know, they need to be taken more seriously because people are always looking at Coach and Specker's gamma, gamma two. You know, the gamma two is this nice work that is in the Red Hat book, but uh, they they seldom look at the graph number three. You know, this is <laughs> this is this is uh, well, I cannot uh, because there is no time. Uh, I spoke with Specker about that often, and um, uh, and Specker was a little bit um, sad that uh, not too many people listened also to the other works. <laughs> so well, so yes yes the answer is yes maybe yeah. Okay okay thanks Carl for this very interesting talk. So now we have to move to the next speaker of this morning section. Please, Gerardo, if you can, try to share your screen. Yes, I will. So we thank Carl. So we, we give a, like <laughs> internet uh, claps for Carl. And now, Gerardo, please, the, the next talk of this morning session is by Professor Gerardo Adesso from the Nottingham University. And he will speak about a quantum Gibbs paradox. Please, Gerardo. Go Thank on. you very much. Uh, let me just see if I can. No, I think it's fine. Yes. Hi. Well, of course, I would have loved to be there in Argentina with all of you. Um, uh, we just made it to Cordoba. I've not been with you the whole, the whole 10 years in the past, but I was there in Cordoba in 2019. And I think by the time we were doing that conference, probably all this mess was starting in China about the same time. So the world has different plans and now we're doing this online, but I hope that at least this made it easier for several colleagues to just uh, take part in this event and support the development of quantum foundations in Argentina, which is uh, really promising. And I was really impressed by uh, what I learned two years ago and hopefully what I will learn during this conference. So thanks again for inviting me and for um, organizing this event. Thank you, Gerardo. Zoom. Thank you for being here. Thanks. You're welcome. Right. So what, what did I talk to about uh, two years ago was indeed about indistinguishable particles. And in a certain sense, we're still talking about them. But today we're going to give it um, a rather different spin. So last time we were interested more into whether entanglement between distinguishable particles is a real resource or not. But today we move in even more into the foundational side of things. And the idea is, as most of my research, um, my interest is in actually trying to work out what are, if there are any boundaries to the quantum world. So this is a nice picture by Zurek. And sometimes I see myself as this little guy patrolling the border between the classical and the quantum world, whichever way we aim to define them. And the idea is that I'm interested in identifying some signatures that are distinctive and they can only happen in the quantum world, but maybe they get lost once we move out towards the classical world. So there are many of these things that the most famous ones might be superposition, coherence, entanglement, and some of these signatures that are non-localities, you were debating about them, contextuality and so on. So some of these are uniquely quantum, some others may be features of more general theories, but some others are not replicable in the classical case. Whenever we discover more of some traits which are specific quantum or definitely non-classical at least, then the idea is not only this is interesting from a foundational point of view, because we get to understand more about the basic building blocks of quantum mechanics, but this also makes it potentially interesting for people working in the development of new technologies, as we have all seen in the past three decades. So the more we understand about the nature and the use of quantum features like entanglement and so on. So the more we can empower them as resources for novel applications. So we're interested in both of these things. Today, we're going to look at something quite unusual as a resource. And this something is actually ignorance. 
So this talk will identify some, I would say, fundamental difference between classical and quantum mechanics in the power of ignorance within the context of thermodynamics. So let me just go back to talking about the Gibbs paradox as it was known in classical thermodynamics first. Right, so the idea is the following. You have a box. Um, so suppose it's initially divided into two halves. And then at, at the beginning, you just have a gas filling one half of this box. I think you can probably see the pointer here on my screen, right? Hopefully. Um, so, yeah, so you have n particles and they fill up this volume V, which is half of the box. Now you let the, you open the, the membrane in the middle and you let the gas expand isothermally to fill the full box. So twice its original volume. Of course, in this process, you have created entropy and the entropy produced is n ln uh, log two, where n is the number of particles of gas. But then consider this situation here. Suppose from the beginning, you had two species of gas, each filling one half of this box, and then you remove the membrane and both of them expand to fill up the whole volume. So if those two gases were in somehow, in some way distinguishable, so they had some property which differentiates one from the other, in this case, they look like two different colors. They might have two different atomic numbers and so on. So you would say that each of them expands like the first case from V to 2V. And so each of them brings in an increase in entropy given by N log two. So overall you have two N log two. But what is the situation if those two gases were indistinguishable? If they were indistinguishable in the first place, so the presence of this membrane here doesn't actually make a difference because from the very beginning, you would have two N particles of the same gas filling up the whole volume. And even after you expand it, effectively you wouldn't, you wouldn't get any difference. So in this case, the entropy produced would be zero. Now the paradox came from the fact that one can imagine that maybe these two gases are only very slightly distinguishable or maybe the degree of freedom that distinguishes them is not detectable by your apparatus. And so you have a limit in which they effectively become indistinguishable. And then you would have some discontinuous jump from this situation here, where you produce two n log two of entropy to the situation which you actually produce nothing. So how to reconcile this paradox? There's been several studies um, in the past 50 years, I would say. Some, attempt, some resolutions to this were actually by realizing that maybe we are counting it wrong in the case in which the particles are indistinguishable. So some studies by founding fathers like Gibbs, Boltzmann themselves, they were just saying, actually the way we, I've been presenting it, it doesn't look quite right because the entropy is not extensive in that case. So if we assign labels to each of the particles, they are not physical in the case in which the particles are actually indistinguishable. So suppose that of course, for distinguishable particles, they could individually um, identify each of them in their state. And so the state space would have um, a volume V to the N. Uh, the entropy, if those states were distinguishable would be of course the log of the state space. But in my case, I cannot. So permutations of the different particles would just count it as the same state. So I have to renormalize my uh, phase space here by factor n factorial. And in this way, when I count uh, the entropy from the number of microstates, then I would have something which in the limit of large n is actually extensive. This is the way people have been looking at this phenomenon before, but this is not what I'm interested in in this talk. In this talk, we're actually interested in the operational meaning of this paradox. And this was, I think, very nicely understood by Jaynes in one of his papers on this paradox. So what he said is that actually this is not really a paradox, but it is corresponding to a physical situation which models the capability of different observers. So whether two gases are distinguishable or indistinguishable, it is in the eye of the observer. So it's, it just means whether we have the, the facilities to be able to access the degrees of freedom that distinguish them or not. If they are distinguishable, so if we can actually access those degrees of freedom separately, then this information that we have about them, so this entropy which is produced, 
can actually give us a product, which is work. So we can extract work from this situation that is proportional to this 2n log 2, because of course we can couple to each of those two species of gas differently. For instance, through some semi-permeable membrane, which only lets one different species pass in one way or the other. And so we can actually extract as much work by coupling piston to this through the expansion of the gases. If on the other hand, so the observer which can do this and can extract work from this system would be named as an informed observer. So he can access, or they can access these degrees of freedom. On the other hand, we can have an observer that doesn't have this facility. And so it is ignorant to the degrees of freedom that distinguish the two gases. And this ignorant observer, there's no way they can extract any work from this situation when we let the gases expand. So this, this difference in entropies is not just something artificial, but it corresponds to the capabilities of different observers when they are approaching and exploiting this particular toy model, which is gases in a box, in order to extract work. So he puts it this way, so the amount of useful work we can extract depends on how much subjective information we have about this microstate. So this is not a paradox, but a platitude. James was quite arrogant all the time, but um, I think it, it, it put this thing, this thing right. Now, we accept this uh, understanding, but of course we want to go one step beyond. And then we ask, what's going to happen in case we model these gases fully by using quantum mechanics? So in recent years, many of you have been following the developments of the quantum theory of thermodynamics. So many of the fundamental laws of thermodynamics have to be adjusted. And a lot of discovery has been going on in order to understand how to properly take into account processing of resources in thermodynamics by analyzing what is the role of quantum phenomena like coherence and so on. And this has led to, as I said, revisitation of second law into many different second laws, which can be understood from a resource theoretic point of view, has led to novel protocols for um, work extraction empowered by quantum correlations, um, has led to uh, novel uh, models and experiments uh, in implementing refrigerators, heat exchangers, thermal machines in general with just one or a bunch of atoms, so in the fully quantum regime. In this case, we are interested in the process of work extraction from gases which might be indistinguishable or distinguishable depending on the capabilities of observers. So I want to find what are the fundamental limits on work extractable by different observers when we have the situation, so Gibbs mixing uh, of bosonic or fermionic particles. Right, so I think in the talk I will mostly focus on bosons, but most of these things can be adjusted for fermions as well. So the way we develop this is as follows. I'll present a very simple toy model, and then I will show that it actually works by reproducing the results of the classical case, which I've shown earlier. And then we have to come up with the quantum description of the different observers. So being ignorant or informed, it means which operations that observer is allowed or not allowed to do. And then of course, we look at the results. So is the quantum ignorant observer going to be more powerful than the classical ignorant observer? Yes, but you will see. Okay, so what is the model? Well, as before, we have a box with um, two sides, and then we ideally divide it in cells. This will map different configurations of the particles. In uh, so It's a discrete grid of configurations. It's D over two cells in each of the sides. And we start with N particles on each side, in this case, N equal three. Right, so we make the gases distinguishable. So of course we have the degree of freedom, which is configuration where each particle is sitting in each uh, cell of the grid. But then we have an extra degree of freedom, which we might think of as spin, for instance, just as if you want spin, spin one half. So they can be up or down once we place them. Important thing is in this very, let's say, basic toy model, we are assuming that all cells are degenerate in energy. So if you want, this would correspond to having a Hamiltonian which vanishes. Or you might think of a limit of a non-vanishing Hamiltonian when you have high temperature. So that effectively they are all degenerate in energy. 
This is fine because we can show it models the ideal gas or reconstructs the classical case. So we assume at the beginning, each of the two halves, the, the gases which are in there are thermalized. And then we will see what happens once we let them expand and interact. So the informed observer is one that has access to the spin degrees of freedom. By having access, I mean, he can read them out, he can make measurements on them, but he cannot change the number of particles which are spin up or spin down because that's um, conservation law. But they can at least access those degrees of freedom in the measurements. The ignorant observer cannot. So every dynamics that we model from the point of view of the ignorant observer has to be independent of spin. So we have to trace over those degrees of freedom. They can only access the configuration space. Okay, so as I said, is it too naive? What is the question is, can we actually extract work? So can we relate calculation of entropies in this model from actual work extraction? And the answer comes again from recent developments in thermodynamics from a resource theoretic point of view. So in the so-called resource theory of quantum thermodynamics, what the observers are allowed to do are thermal operations, which means you have a system, you can couple it with the thermal reservoir, so you can append as many other systems in thermal states as you want. Then you're allowed to, wait, do I have a chance? Uh, no. Okay, so you're allowed to uh, do global unitary operations on system and all these uh, additional reservoirs, so like uh, work battery and so on, which have to be uh, conserving the total energy. So energy preserving global unitaries, and then you can trace over the ancillas. All of this, they correspond to a set of quantum channels on your main system, which are called thermal operations. They've been well characterized. So under this framework, you can show that you can extract work from a system by using thermal operations. And this work is upper bounded by the difference in free energy before and after the process. So, we will go and calculate difference in entropies there between initial and final states by means of the von Neumann entropies in the quantum case, with the idea that there exists some thermal operation which asymptotically allows you to extract as much work as KBT times that difference of entropy. So I will present results for the entropies, but you rest assured by this. Um, framework that there exists, at least in principle, I'm not saying that we can implement it in the lab easily, but there exist operations which give operational meaning to these entropies here in the same spirit as Jane's uh, in the classical case. Right, so it models the ideal classical gas in a way that I will just show in a, in a moment. So if we want to see what happens in the classical case, then all these entropies, they can just be computed by counting configurations and microstates. So let's revisit the classical case. At the beginning, we have on each side a uniform distribution of N identical particles over D over two cells. At the final state, then of course, we will have a uniform distribution of all the configurations of all the particles to N over all the cells in this box, which are D cells. So we just have to count properly. Um, so if the observer is informed so they can distinguish the spin degrees of freedom so configurations so states where particles are in the same configuration but they have different spin will be counted as different states for the ignorant observers those configurations will just be the same so what are the results that we get here let's let's navigate through them so at the beginning we have n particles in each side uniformly distributed over D over two cells. Okay, so in one side we have um, n particles over D over two, on the other side, n particles over D over two. And whether they are distinguished or indistinguishable, it doesn't matter. So the entropy at the beginning will be just twice this factor here. At the end, after we have let the Gibbs mixing uh, happen, then if they are, indistinguishable, then of course, it doesn't really matter whether we can or not uh, access the spin degrees of freedom because they actually have no difference. So there's no spin dependence in this case. So we will just have two N particles uniformly distributed over D configurations. And this is this term here that you see in all of the, th the three green boxes. 
But if on the other hand, the particles are distinguishable and the observer can distinguish them, then they would see twice n particles distributed uh, over D cells because they will be two different species. And so in this yellow box, uh, bottom left, then you see that the term for the final entropy in this case by an informed observer with distinguishable gases will be different, actually higher. Now we're going to take some limits in order to recover what we have said before in the, in the classical Gibbs paradox. And the limits are the following. First of all, large number of particles. So it's a kind of macroscopic limit. But on the other hand, also low density. So we have a lot more cells in the grid. It's kind of a, almost a continuous limit, continually. So you have a lot more cells uh, in the grid than the actual particles that fill them. If you take those two limits, then there's no entropy production in three out of four cases, where zero means something going logarithmic in N, so which is of course vanishing compared to something going linear in N. Yeah? Well, on the other hand, for the informed observer with distinguishable gases, they can see a difference in entropy, which is 2N log 2, just like in the classical case. And as I said, so this corresponds to actual abilities to extract work from that system. Right, so now we have to model the quantum case. I still have a bit of time. In the quantum case, I'm not going to cover all of these cases separately because if the gases are identical, there's nothing you can do. There's no work you can extract, they just mix. And if the observer is informed and the gases are distinguishable, this is also the best you can do. You're not going to improve this, but it's going to be very surprising what happens for an ignorant observer in the quantum case. So this is the case we're going to focus on. Right, so in the quantum case, now I'm going to go through a bit of maths here. We have to model uh, things properly, taking into account the symmetries um, and the structure of the problem. So what we have here is as follows. The Hilbert space for a single particle is going to be a composition of two Hilbert spaces, one for the configuration degree of freedom, so the spatial one. And this one is a d-dimensional Hilbert space if there are d cells. Okay, so we assign basis states depending on which cell our particle sits. And on the other hand, then you have the spin degrees of freedom. As we say, this is just a qubit. So it's a two-dimensional Hilbert space. But on top of this, we have here um, particles that have to, res to respect the exchange statistics. So overall, when we combine um, the Hilbert space for n particles, then depending on their nature, we have to consider projection onto the symmetric or the anti-symmetric subspace, depending if they are fermions, uh, bosons or fermions respectively. So overall, the Hilbert space would be just the um, projection of these big tensor products over the corresponding subspace. So when we're going to do permutations on different particles, then you will have composition of permutations on the configuration and on the spin state. But because they have to respect the overall symmetry, then these permutations will couple those degrees of freedom. And so we can effectively decompose our big Hilbert space for n particles in terms of subspace, which are indexed by a specific symmetry. So I'm cutting, uh, I'm giving an example here, for instance, if you have the simplest example that we're all familiar with. So if we have just two particles and two cells, then of course we have um, the spatially symmetric configuration of this particle is coupled with the spin symmetric triplet configuration. Yeah, where there's up, up, down, down, and then up, down, plus, down, up. This is a three-dimensional subspace, which we all know is the triplet. And this will couple with the spatially symmetric uh, configuration. That's an allowed state. On the other hand, the spatially anti-symmetric configuration will couple with the spin anti-symmetric configuration, which is the singlet. If we have fermions, then coupling is inverted. This will be coupled with this, this will be coupled with this to respect the overall anti-symmetry requirement. So effectively what we've been doing here is we've been decomposing our space into two subspaces, one that we call the singlet, one that we call the triplet, indexed by a quantum number that is like an eigenvalue of a total angular momentum operator. And this is easy to do, we all do it in the case of two particles, but in general, this can be done for the big Hilbert space of n particles by making use of the so-called Schur-Weil duality. So each specific symmetry of the wave function, spatial wave function will be indexed by value of this coefficient. 
So we can decompose our Hilbert space in this way. We have to apply this thing twice. So once we apply and then we decompose into spatial and um, spin permutations uh, configurations, then we apply it again to the spin case, which is by itself also an angular momentum. And then we get the following decomposition. So our Hilbert space for n particles can be decomposed into subspaces indexed by J, where this uh, term HX would correspond to um, irreducible representations of the unitary group of dimension D, and the other um, HS subspace uh, would correspond to irreducible representations of U2. All right, this, this looks very good because we have effectively in this way explicitly um, decoupled within each subspace with a given J, we have decoupled the, the spatial and the spin degrees of freedom. So now what we know is we have to model the capability of this ignorant observer. And in this way, it is transparent because the ignorant observer can only access the spatial degrees of freedom has no control over the spin ones. So now we have to input all these conditions to determine what are the operations that the ignorant observer can implement on the system. When, so the dynamics, that the gas can, um, the dynamics that our system can undertake will be constrained if we are not able to access the degrees of freedom of spin. So overall, I said our um, observer can access, uh, can, can implement thermal operations, which correspond to global energy preserving unitaries on system heat path, work battery, and any additional thermal uh, reservoir if needed. So this U has to be energy preserving, but for the ignorant observer, there is more because it only has to act on this specific subspace. If, and, the, and overall, then we also have the fact that it needs to preserve the exchange symmetry, of course. So if you combine all these ingredients together, it is easy to see that this specific set subset of channels conserves our quantum number J. So in, what it means, it means that the thermalization happens independently within each uh, subspace with a given special symmetry J. So according to, the, according to the informed observer, the system was initially thermal in each of the halves and then can just fully thermalize um, through the Gibbs mixing. But according to the ignorant observer, this cannot happen. We can only let each individual subspace thermalize. So the state of the system as described by this observer with limited capability is just a mixture, which can be written as a direct sum of states, each living in this subspace with, for a given J with certain probabilities that we can work out. And now as a matter, uh, as a consequence of this um, Gibbs mixing, each of those evolves independently within its subspace because J is conserved for these operations. Okay, so this is what happens. We start from a state like this, and then it evolves so that it thermalizes within each subspace. And we cannot just send it through a general thermal state because this violates the constraints that we have for this observer. I think I do have a, okay. So now what we need to do, we need to calculate the difference in entropy before and after. So the before is always the same, as we said, in the end, the state has evolved into this uh, mixture of local maximally mixed state. So the entropy at the end is just given by um, sum over j, pj, ln of dj, where dj are the di dimensions of each of those subspaces. And pj's can be computed from composition of angular momentum. So effectively we are treating groups of spins on one side and groups of spins on the other side as two large spins. And then from the klebsch gordon coefficients you obtain from combining this angular momentum, you can calculate this. I have all the expressions in the paper, but I'm not going to put them on the, on the screen because they're just ugly combinatorial things. And similarly, you can get the DJ from, from the sure duality, so from representation theory. We have all these formulas. We can just analyze them now in uh, useful limits. So first of all, this quantity, it cannot exceed the entropy difference for the informed observer, which was equal in the classical and the quantum case and was just given by this. That's the best that they can do. But interestingly, this can be larger than the corresponding classical ignorant observer's case. And as I said, this is not just, uh, you know, calculating stuff from number theory, but it will translate into a work extraction 
that on average is given by KBT times this entropy difference. On average, why I say on average? Because of course we can, there exist some thermal operations subject to these constraints, which extracts given amount of work within each subspace with the fixed J. Then overall, the average work that can be extracted, we can calculate by mediating over this with this probability. So of course we have that there is this fluctuating quantity. So work in this case is a fluctuating quantity, but on average will correspond to this um, physical uh, entropy production. Now, this is also, I don't know if I have it here or later. So I also comment on whether not just, okay, the average work is maybe dead, but is it feasible that we can actually extract this in practice? And the answer is yes, because you will see that the fluctuations around the mean are negligible. Um, so effectively, there's not too much variation between these different subspaces in the amount of work that we can actually extract. So it is probabilistic, but it almost is deterministic in this case. We will see in a moment. Right, so for example, let's consider this situation. So we have, again, two cells, uh, two particles, so one particle per side. And then we're going to write the initial state where we have one spin up at the left side and one spin down at the, the downside. You can manipulate this state and it just becomes a superposition of this form. So you will have here effectively one state that belongs to the J equal one subspace, if you want the triplet one. And then you have here the singlet state. Now, this would be the initial state. Once you let uh, the system undergo the evolution, each of the subspaces will thermalize independently. So the singlet subspace is only this state, so it will remain the same. It's not going to change. On the other hand, the state in the J equal one subspace will evolve towards a mixture, a uniform mixture of all the three basic states in this subspace. So at the end, the, pro the entropy production would be, L because there are three here, so it would be one half ln of three plus nothing here. And so you see it is non-zero. So the ignorant observer can witness something in this case, even without having access to the actual degrees of freedom of spin. Right, so we can actually make some plots in order to analyze this quantity and look at the limits. So let's look at these plots. These are for bosons. I have similar ones for fermions. And we are plotting here the difference in entropy before and after the Gibbs mixing as observed by different observers. Now, this upper bound here would be just 2n log 2, which we know is the limit in the classical informed case. The classical ignorant observer, we know will converge to zero in the appropriate limit. So these two plots on the left is just small n, on the right is larger n. So remember, we need large n and even larger d to work out the limits we want. So d is increasing on the horizontal axis. This, as, as we know, there's nothing the ignorant classical observer can do. But on the other hand, the gap between informed and ignorant observer in the quantum case gets actually smaller and smaller with increasing d. And it can be calculated exactly analytically in the limit in which d is very large over n and n is also large that gap tends to zero. So in the relevant limit, in the quantum case, both the ignorant observer and the informed observer can actually extract the same amount of work from the system, which is completely different from the classical case. So the capability of the ignorant observer without having access to that degree of freedom that distinguishes the two gases tend to be the same as the capabilities of the fully informed observer. So if we go back, as I said, to the issue of deterministic versus probabilistic work, we can work out the variance around the mean for work extraction in these um, different subspaces. And in the usual limit for large number low density, this variance is actually a constant. So it is negligible compared with the mean that scales with n. So I can go back to the original table. I can fill it in now. All those cases, they remain zero because for indistinguishable gases, there's nothing we can do. But if they are distinguishable and an informed observer can extract 2n log 2 uh, KBT work from the system, a quantum ignorant observer in the appropriate limit can extract as much work as the informed one. While for a classical case, ignorant observer has nothing to do with it. So interestingly enough, that's very puzzling because 
the maximum difference between classical and quantum thermodynamics in this specific phenomenon appears in a macroscopic limit where you would think that maybe the world would just become classically, but it's actually not the case. So if I have time, I think I probably very just a couple of minutes to try and explain why this yeah, thing yes, is Yes, Gerardo, please go on. Please go yeah. on and then you, you, yeah, you will have some Okay, time, yeah, some I don't questions. want to take yeah. time off questions, but- No, it's just, fine, fine. Okay, let's see. Right, so we have said, let us focus on this low density limit. So there are a lot of cells, most of them will be empty. Um, so there's almost no, at most you would think that there's one particle per cell, yeah? So let us consider that, for instance, we have two N particles, that they will not have double occupancy if there are so many, that is the actual low density limit, so with high probability. And so we will just consider configurations which are corresponding to, say, the first, we just give labels to the cell. So the first two N cells will be the occupied ones and all the others will be empty. So for this spatial configuration, a spin configuration is just going to be a permutation of n particles with spin up and n particles with spin down. The question is, if we do not have access to this spin part, how much information do we lose? So we, remember this uh, reasoning holds specifically for the low density limit. As you see, you reach there as a limit for, for uh, higher density, then of course things are more complicated. But in this case, just, everything just reduces to um, Hilbert space of two n qubits. And we can apply the same trick as before. So apply the shrewd wide duality and then we decompose it into subspaces where we have here a component um, that, um, that runs over the reducer representations of the special unitary group dimension two. And that this would be for the spatial part. And then on the other hand, you just have the um, other subspace, which is the reduced representations of the uh, spin, uh, yeah, of the SN and the uh, all possible permutations of the cells. So a basis for this um, Hilbert space can be written as we do with the um, normal angular momentum, but noting that the last one is, uh, is uh, corresponding now to the group of permutations. So a basis for this um, decomposed space can be written in terms of the sure basis in terms of three quantum number J M P. So J would be again, uh, corresponding to the spatial symmetry M would be like an eigenvalue of the total Z component of the spin and P would correspond to the permutations. But now the idea is if you are ignorant then you do not have access to M to the M part. So you cannot operate on one of these subspaces but the point is, if you ignore M, you have nothing to lose because M was fixed anyway. It's just the difference between number of particles up and number of particles down, which as we said, was conserved. So you cannot change this, even if we have access to spin degrees of freedom. So once you decompose things in this way for the low density limit, you realize that all the basis states in this short basis can be distinguished by the ignorant observer, even if you do not have any access to the spin itself. And you can come up with examples, for instance. So for uh, two particles, then there are two distinguishable states. This would be again, a singlet, uh, like the, this symmetric and undisymmetric state, singlet and triplet, perfectly distinguishable without having to actually measure the spin. And this you can do by sending them through a kind of bin splitter, as I will say in a moment. For D equal, for three particles, so N equal three, then the idea is, states in the sure basis are perfectly distinguishable without accessing the spin component. Maybe states in the original configuration spaces would be a lot more complicated, but there exists a basis in which they are all distinguishable without having to access that. And so for this reason, in this limit, you do not lose any information by not having access to the spin degrees of freedom. So what I wanted to say first that the analogy in quantum optics is as follows. Suppose you have two photons and then you want to distinguish whether they have the same or different polarization but you only have a non-polarizing B splitter and photon counters. Both of these things would correspond to capabilities of an ignorant observer with respect to the, um, the polarization. But actually, if you send them through, uh, then you, you will know that if you only get the two particles at one side or two particles at the other side, then at the beginning they had the same polarization. Or if you just get um, the other configuration here, 
So you will, so one, 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 one. So then you know that they had different polarization in the first place. And so it is possible to distinguish these cases without having to have apparatus which are sensitive to that particular degrees of freedom. And the situation with the gases is exactly the same in the low density limit. Right, so there've been, I think this is it. So there've been other works recently about thermodynamics with identical particles, which are interesting to look if you want, but just to summarize, in the quantum mechanics, there is some relational spin information that you can imprint upon degrees of freedom which are observable, but you can distinguish superpositions of configurations which are classically indistinguishable, even if you have not act any access to that particular degree of freedom. I try to explain very quickly at the end why this works. So in the most extreme macroscopic case in the low density, you can get as much from an ignorant observer as from an informed one. And this is our version of a quantum, fully quantum Gibbs paradox. And interestingly enough, so you, you cannot say that classical thermodynamics emerges in the, in the thermodynamic or macroscopic limit, because actually there you have the maximum divergence between the two cases. So we can look at variations of these with more realistic models and actually how to implement the operation that extract work in practice. This may be very complicated because it means that your ignorant observer needs to rotate the system in the sure basis in order to extract the information that they want. But to make to implement the sure transform is of the same complexity as the quantum Fourier transform, which enters say in sure uh, in a Shor's algorithm. So it might be that actually realizing this might be as complex as implementing universal quantum computing. So we have not come up with some simple way to to actually implement in, in the lab this work extraction from an ignorant uh, observer, but we are working on finding approximate ways to still do better than the classical case, even though we cannot reach the optimum one. I think that's it. Uh, the paper appeared a few months ago in Nature Communications, and uh, this was done with two indistinguishable Benjamins, like last time. So Morris and Yadin, they are now distinguished. They work in different places, but at the time they were both in nothing. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thanks, Gerardo, for this great, great talk. So now we open the space for some questions. There is some time for a question. Does anybody in the oceans? Sebastian Fortin has a question. Please, Sebastian, go on. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you, Gerardo, for the very interesting talk. Uh, I have a conceptual question. I, I want uh, to know uh, what do you think about uh, the possibility of to think uh, that the description of the ignorant observer can be considered as a gross description of the fine description of the informer observer? Uh, this is a possibility or they are, they are fully incompatible? No, no, I think, I think, I think that's fine. Because if you see here, what we need, it is definitely that. So the, it depends where you, where you put this fine graining. Yeah. So once we had written all the states in this way, let me see. Yeah. So in general, you, in principle, you can have all states of this Hilbert space, but the problem is the ignorant observer does not have access to one part of it. So it has to trace over those degrees of freedom. And so only has um, access to a limited set of operations that conserve this constraint and will describe the dynamics with the limited set of states which are confined within that subspace. So it is in a sense, as you say, um, you are neglecting some degrees of freedom. So it is like a coarse grained version of what uh, the informed observer can do, which is only constrained by having to use thermal operations and the exchange symmetry it does not have this additional requirement. Of course, in this case, we only have spatial and spin. You might think of some more complex situation where you have several degrees of freedom, and maybe you can do this progressive coarse graining, as you say, by having observers with different intermediate capabilities. They can distinguish some of them, but not all of them. And it would be interesting to see whether we have a hierarchy of possibilities and whether this is very special in this case or whether they all converge even when you have more degrees of freedom, whether they all converge to the full uh, fine graining capabilities once you limit uh, um, uh, the access to degrees of freedom. I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yes, 
Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so we now thank again Professor Gerardo Adesso, and we take a short break until 10.30. Um, we will stay here, but uh, you can go for a coffee now, and then we come back uh, exactly at 10.30 for Johan Martin's talk. Johan, thank if you, you are much. there... And, I will try and, to wait. I have to unshare. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Thanks, Gerardo. So, thank you very Johan, much. If, if you want to give it a try to see if your, yes. so your if you want to share you want to the presentation yeah, yeah, works. I stop. Okay, fine. Thank, okay. Thanks, Gerardo. So we are, we are, we are going to leave. Eh? <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry, we, we will stay to... leave. Everything will be... Uh, uh, oh, but you can take a... Two people can take a 10 minutes break until 10.30. So I'm... Looking at it perfectly, Johan. So perhaps you can put it uh, full screen. Oh, yes, yes, I can do. So, great, great, it's perfect. So, as I told you, we have uh, until 10.30. We, we start exactly in five minutes. So if you want to go for coffee or something, you can. How are you doing, Shohan? Well, it's, uh, we have a light uh, snowfall, and <laughs> it's, it's uh, about one degree or so, and we are in full lockdown in, in Vienna. Uh, so I'm at home, you know? <laughs> not too bad, but it's also not great. <laughs> I would, yeah, it's I would, a mighty that. Uh, that yeah. we we did this online. Otherwise, you could be here oh. enjoying the beautiful weather of yeah. Buenos Aires yeah. in <laughs> Argentina. Very, very much, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, some years ago, I was in uh, Cordoba, and ah. it was very pleasant. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we don't know where where it will we will organize this conference next year, but we hope it is presential uh, again. And everything gets better. <laughs> yeah, let's hope. So <laughs> now we have a new version of this um, virus coming up. Uh, so this yeah, yeah. And, yeah uh, but, there are but, already but it, cases. But it seems that the, that the vaccination campaigns are working good, at least here. Yeah. We hope that it lasts <laughs> Hopefully. until next year. <laughs> so I had already yeah. three, three vaccinations. And yeah, several people is uh, getting the third dose right now uh, during these days. Uh, so. I have it already. I was uh, vaccinated with Moderna. Ah, good Moderna. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, but but one never knows. So I'm I always want to be on the safe side. So it uh, means uh, I'm wearing mask and, and I'm avoiding to go out uh, if not necessary. Actually, it's forbidden. So we have to stay at home only for special purposes, like to go to work or to uh, to uh, buy something for living. It's forbidden. To yes, to yes, work. yes. I see. Very similar here. Very similar. Yeah. Yeah. So, but if you have really everything at home, it's it makes no. Sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well. And so, so to work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, here, I mean, if you are a theoretical physicist, uh, it's easier, right? Because you can just do calculations with your computer yeah. if they are working. <laughs> if your right. computer is working, no problem. But yeah, for experimental physicists, it, it's been hard, right? It's harder. Yes, but for this experiment uh, about which I want to report, it's also not so bad because it's in an underground lab and the test fully remotely controlled. So we can uh, control ah. our experiment. Only if something is breaking down, then you have really problems. Huh? Yeah, but no, there, there's not, not too many people there, I guess. So people can go and just... <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, Italy is a little bit different than Austria. So they are in the uh, yellow color. So that means 
uh, they can move freely. Ah, and I see. Only, only Austria and partly Germany and especially the Netherlands and uh, and uh, Denmark, they have uh, a lockdown. So, well. So we uh, it is fantastic eh, that you, you operate uh, this uh, <laughs> very complex machinery remotely. Eh? It's uh, really, uh, really yeah, impressive. Yeah. That's an advantage. <laughs> Yeah, you're it's, right. You know? Yeah, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, it's uh, 29, so we're starting one minute. Mm. Remember that we are going live on YouTube and uh, we will edit, of course, the talks uh, by the end of the conference and separate them in slots and then put it on the website. So it's very nice to have you here. So people that couldn't attend, they can, uh, or, or, or someone who didn't understood the detail, he can just look at it and, and, and then perhaps ask you by email. So, yeah. well, let's start now with the second part of this morning session. We are grateful to have uh, Professor Johan Martin from the Stefan Mayer Institute from Vienna. So please, Johan, go on. Thank you so much. So it's a pleasure to be at least online in this uh, meeting. So that uh, tense conference on quantum foundations taking part in taking uh, taking place in Buenos Aires. Unfortunately, I cannot be there. It's uh, we have in a, a full lockdown in, in Austria, and so I want to uh, give you some uh, information about our experiment in uh, Gran Sasso. You can see my my pointer here? Yes, yes, perfectly. Yeah. Okay, so here you see uh, the surrounding of our experiment in Gran Sasso. And, uh, okay, so. Oops. Not going on. Perhaps if you click on the ah. screen, screen, yeah. So, yeah, okay, I'm coming to the outline of my talk. So the power exclusion principle, as you know, is a solid pillar of quantum mechanics. It's a very robust rule. The question is, what is the reason for this uh, power exclusion principle? So even Pauli could not uh, answer this question. And, uh, and the other question is, are there really no violations? So first, it's connected with the periodic system of the elements was a, a starting point. And uh, also it's connected with the stability of matter, with the stability of neutron stars, and also uh, some point uh, has to do with quantum gravity. Okay, so we have, um, we want to, with high accuracy, an experimental test of the power exclusion principle. So I will explain some methods for testing the power exclusion principle, which were already done by others. And uh, so uh, recent improvements of, the, of our experimental apparatus I will show and results obtained so far. And then I will summarize and give a brief outlook. Okay, so here you see the collaboration of the VIP2 experiment, mainly uh, the participants are coming from Italy, some from Austria, France, Germany, Romania, and Switzerland. Okay, so Pauli in 1925 uh, uh, said, in an atom, there cannot be two or more equivalent electrons for which the values of all four quantum numbers coincide. If an electron exists in an atom for which all these numbers have definite values, then the state is occupied. So this was published in a German language, Zeitschrift für Physik, in 1925. And the question is what, what uh, Pauli is uh, meaning with four quantum numbers, because the spin was not known. So Pauli was also uh, named the uh, double faceness of the electron. So uh, it was pointing in the, in the direction. Okay, so these are uh, 
Teacher of Physik. And uh, you know, you see here, Pauli was also sometimes in sport beside his uh, theoretical work uh, using a slide. Uh, and also with uh, Niels Bohr, he was uh, discussing the, the uh, angular momentum. But spin is, is, uh, is, is more than that. So it's classically not describable uh, double faceness of the electron. Okay, so the power exclusion principles in principle is intrinsically connected with the spin. So if you uh, look in the in the uh, uh, handbook for students, it's saying yeah, uh, spin statistics uh, theorem is giving immediately rise of the power exclusion principle. Okay, so in uh, uh, Ralf Kronig was a student of Pauli. He suggested that electrons have spin. Funny, in the same year uh, as Pauli formulated the Pauli exclusion principle. And Pauli was not so impressed by this idea and said it's indeed a not very clever idea. It's a cl very clever idea, but has nothing to do with reality. So Pauli actually uh, changed his mind afterwards, but uh, our knowledge today is that we have only bosons and fermions. So the symmetric states are related to bosons and the anti-symmetric states to fermions. So here you can only one particle per quantum state. And these uh, two uh, bosons and fermions obey to different statistics as you know. So the real uh, uh, discovery of uh, the spin was done by by uh, Gaut, Smith, and Uhlenbeck. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, they did not get the Nobel Prize. That's an interesting fact. And okay, our knowledge, but our knowledge today is we have only bosons and fermions. And both um, sides are very interesting. So fermions are, um, uh, so uh, leptons, uh, quarks, baryons, they, uh, belong to the class of fermions and bosons, uh, uh, carrier of bosons and carrier bosons, so Ws and Z and mesons, so two quark states. Okay, so the, the general principles of quantum theory do not require that all particles are either bosons or fermions. The restriction comes from a postulate by Messier. And the, then the, uh, the bosons and fermions are separated. And there were several attempts to violate the spin statistics, uh, attempts like parastatistics, so uh, was a, leading to a large effect. This was ruled out. Then Ignatieff and Kutmin, so gave negative squared norm states and so on, the QM theory, space-like commutativity phase and so on. So ever, Every problem had is a uh, uh, weak point. So, and the, the test of the power exclusion principle also is uh, leading to, to negative results. And that's why we are pretty sure that it's, it's a fundamental whole of nature. So all the proofs are negative proofs. So no single experiment uh, could provide a positive signal of uh, a Pauli exclusion principle violation. It's by the way, it's the same like in the CPT case. So in the uh, uh, combined symmetry CPT also up to now there's no uh, violation. And uh, actually also this CPT uh, theorem is uh, going back to, to Pauli. Uh, okay, so uh, so Pauli wrote this famous paper in, in 1940, it was published, The Connection Between Spin and Statistics. And uh, it, it had uh, uh, about 200 citations, which is not very, very, very many citations for this uh, important paper. But at that time, it was not so popularized. Today, there would be maybe thousands. So also it was uh, discussed uh, 
what uh, uh, Pauli uh, principle uh, has to do with the stability of matter that it does, uh, for instance, this review of modern physics. Uh, then, uh, and also Dyson, uh, he, he uh, investigated the case. So without the Pauli principle, we show that not only individual atoms, but matter and bike would collapse into a condensed high density phase the assembly of any two macroscopic objects would release energy comparable to that of an atomic bomb. So it was realized that it's uh, from the very fundamental point, the Pauli exclusion principle is also responsible for, uh, for the uh, stability of matter. Okay, coming back to the models, so violating the Pauli exclusion principle, I only want to point to these models by Ignatiev and Kutzmin. Uh, they were introducing a, a Pauli violation with a factor of beta. So the, this uh, two state is forbidden. And then uh, you uh, get the uh, probability for a Pauli exclusion principle violation with beta square half, which is commonly used in the literature. Okay. And okay, so several proofs exist in the context of quantum field theory, which differ in clarity and the quality of physical insight. So I want to show this uh, proof by Lüders and Tumino. They lay, laid out a very clean set of assumptions in their proof in 1958. So, uh, and especially interesting is uh, the relation to the, to the Lorentz uh, Lorentz uh, violation or Lorentz uh, not uh, coming to the Lorentz group. So, uh, because this Lorentz uh, violation is also uh, searched for in many experiments now, uh, even with antimatter and so on. And it's, it's, but up to now, there's no positive signal for that. But you see here the, the uh, assumptions they included, and maybe the best candidate would be a, a violation of the Lorentz symmetry. Okay, so uh, Messia Greenberg uh, uh, set up a super selection rule. So in a closed quantum system, you cannot expect that it uh, will change uh, from the initial state to the final state. Um, with a Pauli exclusion principle. So you have to, according to Messier Greenberg, you have to, to use open quantum systems. So you have to introduce some uh, new fermions to test the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay. So, so I wanted only to show that the proof of the Pauli exclusion principle theory is not simple. Pauli pointed out by Pauli himself and the experimental tests the validity limits of the Pauli exclusion principle are complicated and based on different assumptions for specific systems. Okay, so experimental tests, there is a broad variety of tests. So it was tested in atomic transition. That is also the region where our experiment is sitting, then tested with nuclear transition, nuclear reactions, uh, Pauli exclusion principle forbidden, uh, nuclear structures, atomic structures, which are forbidden, neutrino statistics and astrophysics and cosmology. So some of these experimental tests give a pretty high limit, but we want to go beyond this present limits. So what are the requirements of, to do a Pauli exclusion principle violation test? So we need a large number of fermions probing, we have to figure out the characteristic X-ray signal for a unique indicator. We have to use in the experiment very good energy resolution and the high efficient X-ray detection. It's clear because the effect, if uh, it is uh, there, then it's very small and also low background. Also uh, like all the, all the low counting experiments, it's done in a low background environment. So for instance, an underground lab like uh, Gansasto. 
Okay, so here you see some uh, beta square half limits obtained with atomic transitions. So the first one was uh, by Goldhaber and Scharf. Goldhaber is five, was uh, leading to a limit 10 to minus two. Uh, at that time, it was not clear if uh, the beta decay is, uh, is uh, normal electron decay or can be something special and violating the power exclusion principle. And then, then there were other experiments. So uh, the, 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 the past, the, the prototype of our type of experiment was done by Rambe and Snow and leading already to a limit of uh, in the order of 10 to minus 26. Okay, so this was uh, the first experiment by uh, Goldhaber and Scharf Goldhaber, and can be also interpreted with a power exclusion principle test. So Rambeck Snow had a very simple uh, arrangement. So they had a copper strip, an X-ray detector, and the, and the current running through the copper strip. And so usually uh, the, the, the current is running through the conduction band, but there is also interaction with the, with the uh, uh, atoms in the copper and can lead to X-ray emission. And they were uh, using a rather simple X-ray detector. So having an energy resolution of about one kilo electron volt at uh, uh, interesting energy of eight kilo, kilo electron volt. So, and so we wanted to do it, do it better so our principle is, uh, principle, uh, principle is seen here. So they allow transition to P to one S, okay, alpha transition in copper. So there would be uh, an empty place for the transition for the, for the electron and then making a normal transition or the one S state is fully occupied, then it's forbidden by the poly exclusion principle. And uh, this energy, the transition energy is quite different. So the energy uh, shift, if uh, Pauli exclusion principle violating decay occurs, occurs is about 300 electron volt, which is resolvable by modern X-ray spectroscopy. So we are sitting around eight kilo electron volt with our energy. And you see here, that's a normal transition in copper, K-alpha. And so we are looking for, uh, uh, this kind of signal here, which is um, shifted by about 300 electron volt. So, so how we are doing this? So the first experiment we did with charge coupled devices as X-ray detectors. I have to say this, uh, we have a big uh, experience with X-ray detection systems, especially with four pi X-ray detection systems because we use them also to study exotic atoms in Frascati, the Daphne electron positron collider. And so we have to use a four pi geometry not to lose any solid angle. So uh, you see here the effective area of the detectors we are using. So with STTs, we have uh, a single detector has 100 square millimeters, but we're using uh, for pi geometry of silicon drift detector so that we are covering uh, maybe more than 50% of the solid angle. And the energy resolution is around uh, 150 electron volt at six kV and uh, at the region of interest, maybe 180 electron volt, which is a factor of 10 better than in the experiment by Rambeck and Snow. But we have also a time, uh, the timing and probability uh, performance of the silicon drift detectors. That means we can even use uh, active shielding by some plastic scintillators surrounding the target. Okay, so we have uh, here used for the first experiment with the uh, CCDs a copper uh, cylindrical foil surrounded by 16 charge coupled devices. And uh, this was sitting inside a vacuum chamber because the detectors or CCTs have to be cooled to 170 K 
Kelvin by a cryogenic system. And uh, so, and then we had a readout system. And after about uh, two years of running, we got, uh, sorry, we got a limit beta square half, upper limit uh, beta square half is smaller than uh, 4.7 uh, times 10 to minus 29. So already maybe three orders of magnitude improvement uh, uh, compared to Rambeck's no experiment. Okay, so in the two, we're using silicon drift detectors. So they have a higher resolution. Uh, so at eight kilo electron volt, about 180, 90 electron volt. And they are, have timing probability, uh, probability performance and we are using four arrays of uh, two times four silicon drift detectors very uh, the quadratic ones and uh, so with a liquid argon closed circuit cooling to minus 160 uh, degrees Celsius so and for the target we used uh, a strip target very thin target uh, about 25 micrometers and the geometry of seven times two centimeters. So we have a more compact target, which is sitting in front of the X-ray detectors. So, and uh, we have a VITO system. So we're using plastic scintillators for active shielding and, uh, and, uh, and also a lead shielding and like traditional shieldings. Okay. So we are using also higher currents for that. So more than 100 amps. And, and the experiment is sitting below the Gran Sasso, which is the highest mountain in Italy, uh, in Southern Italy. So we have a rock uh, coverage of uh, 1,400 meters. So that is a reduction factor of about 1 million in the cosmic ray flux. Uh, that is good on the one hand side. On the other side, it also needs that we introduce a, a calibration source into the uh, experimental system. So, so we have uh, here tests in the lab made with shielding, without shielding, and so on. And actually, the best situation is given here is a, uh, a, a situation in, in Kansas. So that we expect and it's clear. So the form experiments gave, after about two years running, this uh, uh, 4.7 times 10 to minus 29. So this is published and they want to go uh, better with this. So we are using this arrangement. So the copper targets is sitting inside this uh, vacuum box. So vacuum, because we have to avoid condensation of the uh, water vapor uh, uh, round because we are cooling the, the uh, STDs and uh, we have to also cool the target by water cooling. Otherwise, uh, this thin foils would uh, melt and the target would be destroyed. So this is the arrangement. So here you see inside this, this uh, target and the detection system with the STDs and surrounded by some plastic scintillators to provide active shielding. So the features are, we have, um, we have um, uh, here the STDs, uh, as a, to here an example of these STDs, it's a, a four times two matrix of silicon drift detectors. And we have the shielding of the rock coverage. And okay, that is uh, really much better than in the first uh, stage of the experiment. So we, we improved the vacuum system and had uh, employed new STDs, which we are also using, by the way, for uh, measuring uh, X-rays from keonic hydrogen and keonic deuterium at the Daphne accelerator. So we tested the apparatus at our institute in Vienna, and then we transported and installed the steel system in Kansasso. So this uh, system in Grand Sasso is a kind of uh, tabletop experiment. It's heavy because it needs shielding and lead is, is, uh, is very heavy. So it's, it's a heavy tabletop experiment. 
So you see um, some pictures of installing the uh, two experiments. So inside we have a copper shielding and outside a lead shielding. So it's a line shielding. And inside is this box with a vacuum system uh, mounted. So we, we increased the current up to 180 amps, which was also challenging, but it's working. So the, the, the system is, is running stable. So we could take data even in the pandemic uh, time. So it was not possible to, uh, to, to go so easily to, to the experiment for some uh, safety measures. Uh, but uh, it was running nicely, so it took data also in the pandemic time. So we optimized the slow control system before uh, this uh, pandemic situation occurred, and also the shielding. And uh, we can do in continuous energy calibration of the silicon drift detectors because we have inside the experiment uh, a very uh, low intensity X-ray source. And, and now we are coming to the analysis. So we are using different uh, analysis methods. And so we are now analyzing the new data set. And also we have discussions with theoreticians for the interpretation of this with two X results, even in the framework of quantum gravity inspired models. Okay, so what we measured. So here you see an energy calibrated uh, X-ray spectrum. So here you see peaks from the calibration source, which is a iron 55 uh, source. It's given a, a to transition to mangan manganese, uh, giving a, a nice line at uh, six kiloelectron volt, k alpha k beta. And then we have also some foils of titanium giving these lines. So we can calibrate online our energy spectrum. And here you see the copper peak, which is coming from, from uh, the background events. So even if uh, the cosmic rays is reduced very much, still after a long time, you see this normal copper peak, which is, has nothing to do with Pauli exclusion points or violations. So the violating events would sit right here in the region of interest. Okay, so here you see a spectrum without current and with current. So this green line is a fit of the, of the spectrum uh, without current and the uh, blue line, blue events are without current, sorry. And the red ones is are with current. So we understand the spectrum quite nicely and the Pauli violation would give a shift of 300 electron volt from the normal uh, copper line and sit right here. Okay, so where we are standing now, so we reduced the upper limit for the Pauli exclusion principle over time. So you see the, uh, here the time in days and we are sitting uh, end of this year we expect to sit in the region of 10 to minus 31 for the beta square half uh, quantity. But uh, there's a caveat. So we calculated here the beta square half according to the Rambeck's snow scheme, which includes a strong simplification. So it is valuable to compare the different results. That's why we used this uh, same, the same method. But one has to take into account that the electrons do not go strictly through the copper strip. strip. They are doing a kind of random walk. And that, that why they have uh, more encounters with the atoms than uh, in this uh, simple model by Reinberg and Snow. So taking this uh, random walk into account, that was uh, also uh, checked by uh, uh, a scientist from uh, Trieste, uh, Edi Milotti, then the beta square half is much more stringent and leads to a limit in the range of 10 to minus 42. But okay, this is also to be uh, studied in more detail. 
but you see it's it's we have we are reaching a very high upper very uh, stringent upper limit so let me uh, summarize so the VIP2 experience follows an experimental concept introduced by Remix Snow about 20 years ago. The big advantages are the underground, the laboratory of Kansasso, and the, the good uh, X-ray detectors tested uh, also for exotic atom research. So silicon drift detectors are um, very nice detectors for, for pi installations of X-ray. Uh, spectroscopy and the uh, VIP2 after, after our ex first experiment is set up and running with many improvements. Yeah, okay, if we find a violation effect, then I would say then we have a lot of work in checking our apparatus. So you, you know this uh, story about finding the violation of the sp speed of light in vacuum. That was a uh, a big uh, uh, point. Uh, okay, so the cooperation with theory is extremely important. And uh, so um, Antonino Marciano from Fudan University is working on quantum gravity models. And due to the very high sensitivity of the polysolution principle tests, he uh, is pretty sure that one can test also these uh, models with the findings of our experiments. Okay, so if you want to read more about our experiment, I can uh, uh, give you this reference. So this was published in CERN Korea in March uh, 2018. So putting the power exclusion principle on trial. And so you can find uh, more about our experiments in this paper. So, okay, there is a Flefo Kuhn also looked in the case of power exclusion principle and he said the special place enjoyed by the power exclusion principle in modern theoretical physics does not mean that this principle does not require further and exhaustive experimental tests. So, unfortunately, Flefo Kuhn died, but I think this uh, statement by him is still valid. Oh, hey, a little bit early, but I wanted to close now. And we are preparing also with more stringent tests to test the quantum gravity models. Uh, so that's related with law and symmetry breaking at the Planck scale. You cannot so easily reach the Planck scale in accelerators, you know, but uh, with, uh, with them, uh, experiments with high sensitivity, you can even test some models. Okay, so I thank you very much for your attention. So thanks, thanks, Johan, for this great talk. And we give you uh, internet clubs. <laughs> so let, let's open uh, the microphone for questions. If someone has a question, please announce it here in the chat. I, I have a question which is uh, related to why do you have to cool it down? Because uh, you have to shield this, this device and you have to keep uh, a certain temperature, right? But the question is, by doing that, you are going more and more into the quantum limit. So why would you expect to find a violation of the Pauli execution principle in the quantum limit? What happens with the coherence? Shouldn't we expect a uh, a violation by tending to a classical limit. That remains puzzling for me because, because the, 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 the Pauli exclusion principle seems to be robust against the coherence, right? Because you can hit something, but I, I still believe that the Pauli exclusion yes. principle is still valid. So do you have a take on that? What, what do you think about that? It is intriguing for me. Okay, I have to say that uh, the, the experiment itself is more classical, it's classical. So we do not prepare quantum states and so on. Yeah? Would be also uh, interesting to have uh, experiments, uh, for instance, uh, and it, it's already done in quantum computing. So preparing states and looking if uh, the uh, Pauli exclusion principle is uh, fulfilled. 
but the, our experiment is, is a classical experiment, extra experiment. So we, we do not uh, care about the coherence and so on. Yeah, but uh, I was wondering, because you, you fix a particular temperature, right? You say something like uh, 163 Kelvin, but yeah. would you expect something different but but going to by going to a lower temperature, I mean, or it's yeah, it is a meaningless question. Is it? A I, I would suggest that it, it macroscopically it's classical. So we have uh, yeah. to use these temperatures for our detectors, but not for the for the uh, experiment itself for the ah. ideas experiment. So we have to come down with uh, energy resolution. That's one point, and. Uh, because if you're sitting at higher temperature with the X-ray detectors, you have a lot of shot noise. So your signal will be covered by noise. And uh, to, to find this um, probably very small effect, if there's an effect, you have to go uh, uh, to lower temperature, but not for the quantum machine. It's, it's a yes, I see, I see, I see. So. Yes, so you, you, sh you basically low, low down the temperature of the detectors, but not, not of the system you are detecting. And, yeah. But, yeah. okay, yes, so you, you, your answer is that you wouldn't expect any difference if you cool the system down. So if you make it quantum. I mean, no. Or, no. <laughs> I do not expect in this kind of experiment. So oh, as I yeah. said, if you, if you have an uh, uh, experiment with... Um, single ions uh, or trapped uh, systems uh, prepared for a quantum, uh, for quantum arrangement, then certainly the coherence plays a role. And, and so you have to avoid the coherence and you can check with this um, very well prepared states, the validity of the Pauli exclusion principle, which is already done in, uh, by some experiments. So, and uh, giving also negative results. But the limit is not so high. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Well, are there any other questions or observations in the room? Please write it down in the chat. We have some time. So if we don't have any more questions, we thank again Johan for this wonderful talk. Thanks, Johan, for, for being here with us, at least virtually. <laughs> it's, okay. it's great to see you again, at least uh, yes. in the computer screen. So, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, so I would be very glad to come once to Buenos Aires or to Argentina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We hope, we hope next year the situation gets better and, <laughs> and we get more funding and we can bring yeah, yeah. All, all the people here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <hope> <laughs> so uh, keep healthy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope so. Yeah. We hope so. Okay. Thanks, okay. Johan. So if okay. if Dennis, please, you are there. If you want to start uh, trying to share your screen, I'm here. Great. Can you hear Great. me? Yes. Yes. Perfectly. Uh, let me see my. PowerPoint, share. So do you see that? Yes, yes. Uh, perhaps if you put it uh, in full screen, it's better. Is that OK, the way I have it now? No, I'm only looking at the conclusions section. So you, 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 oh. spoiled, you spoiled your talk. <laughs> no, but I have to, the, the first screen here. Let, let me see. Ah, uh, yeah. Try try to click perhaps on it so it goes. I don't know why why the slides are not moving. I'm only looking at the conclusions. I don't know if he, if if the rest so, of on, us. On my screen, everything is all right. So I, I see my my introduction. Okay. Do you still only see the conclusion? Only the conclusions. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Perhaps if you double click on the first slide. Uh, so somehow it is freezed, I guess. So perhaps if you, yeah, if, if you do that again, it will it will work probably. Okay. This one. Yeah. 
now I Gustavo, Gustavo says, now, now it's moving, eh? now it's moving, so I think it's going to work. And Gustavo says, if you can please uh, try to, uh, with a full screen mode, perhaps it gets fixed. The, the, oh, but ah, no, I know, I know. In, in the right, you have a, a, panel, a, a thing that can move the screen on the right. You have it on the left and also on the right. If you look at it, there's a, a kind of bar that you can use to move the conclusions and go, go up, perhaps. You don't see it. Ah, that's annoying. Uh, on, your, on your right, I see something. And we, I, I don't see the full screen either. It is strange. Well, let me stop sharing again. So yeah. now I'm going. But if you move it, screen. if you move it in your computer, it works, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, but that's not sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's happening. So perhaps I. Let's do this one. Share. What do you see now? Now it's working. Yes, yes. Try to move one, yes, one slide yes. so to see if it works or not. So, but but now it doesn't move. It. <laughs> it doesn't move. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> ah, my apologies. It's so strange. It's, it's the first time that this happens. Yeah, it's a strange. Share screen again. Yeah, now I have this. And can you see that I'm, so. Yeah, now you are again in the conclusion. Now it's moving, yeah, now it's moving. Yeah. yeah. Try and to move I, one again. Yeah, again. And if I do. Go to the second one. But, the, but you don't see the full screen now, do you? I don't see the full screen, but it, it is okay. If you can move it this way, I think uh, it, we will. there advance to, to, to uh... Do you see full screen now? No. No? Well, no, it's I, in... I have full screen. So, so you, you don't see anything moving now? It is not moving now, no. Well, then I'll go back to the... Uh... Yeah. Stop share. Yeah. I'll just use this screen. Is, is that okay? If if I, if I go to, it, does it move now? Yes. No. No. So so you, you don't. See. You see the the different slides. Yes. So better to to present it this way then I think. Yes. Yes. No problem. So, so very sorry for this uh, technical problem. I don't know what it is. But I, I I bought a new computer. <laughs> Perhaps that's the, <laughs> don't worry. This don't is, worry. This is the first time that I use it. So there must be some trick that I haven't uh, been capable of handling uh, still. Well, let 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 me start. So I'm, yes, yes. Go on, please. I've, I've used a couple of minutes, but I'm not too much over time. Uh, I, I think. And so first of no all, problem. first of all, I would like to uh, thank, of course, the organizers for, for inviting me. Uh, and I would also like to congratulate them on organizing these wonderful conferences. I've been to Buenos Aires a couple of times. And I've always uh, enjoyed it. Uh, the, the, and I admire the enthusiasm of the group and of, of, of course, Olympia and and who's, and who's, who is the driving, driving force behind the, all this activity. And uh, well, actually it's fantastic that this is already the 10th event. It's really an historical event. And perhaps it's appropriate for me in that context to, uh, to present something that's, uh, well, a, a bit historical as well. It has an his, historical undertone, and which is quite general. And, uh, and, uh, and, and goes into really foundational and partly philosophical questions. So I will be dealing with uh, Wigner's uh, Fens paradox. 
not quite clear actually whether you should call it a, a paradox, the, the Wittgenstrand situation, a nested experiment to, uh, to, to observers in, in, in one experiment. Well, but we will, we will come to that. Uh, the overview of what I'm going to uh, present here is given here. So first, I will ask myself, what's the core innovation of quantum mechanics, of the quantum mechanical formalism, when you compare it to classical physics? And I think that the core innovation is the uh, non-commutative structure of observables that's present in quantum mechanics, whereas in the classical physics, you have functions on space-time to represent physical quantities. In quantum mechanics, we have the, these operators in Hilbert space and the, the the really important and fundamental point is that these operators don't need to, to compute, commute. And that has a number of consequences and contextuality. That's, uh, well, that's the most general way of uh, characterizing the con consequence of non-commutativity. Non-locality, I would say, is just a symptom of this uh, contextuality. And the measurement problem, which is very often seen as one of the, the, the major problems in the adaptation of quantum mechanics, and perhaps uh, the feature that distinguishes quantum mechanics from classical mechanics, I think that's also a consequence of the non-commutative structure of the quantum mechanical uh, formalism, the algebra of observables. Then I will discuss a way out of the measurement problem. It's, as I said, is a consequence of non-commutativity. And that uh, leads me in the direction of unitary quantum mechanics, which in the foundational literature is not so very often explicitly discussed. Well, there are several interpretations that use only unitary evolution, but I think in the practice of physics, most people use something that falls in this uh, category, even if they are not really explicitly discussing the interpretation of quantum mechanics. Then we will come to weakness friend and how that fits in the complete uh, picture. I will argue that it's not only uh, unitary quantum mechanics that uh, should help us out of the, the problems introduced by contextuality, but we should take an additional step. And that has to do with the introduction of perspectives. And then I will, if time permits, pay some attention to an extended Wigner-Friend setups that have been discussed in the literature of the last couple of uh, years. Uh, they've uh, has been discussed a lot in that literature, and I come to conclusions. So first, this non-commutative structure of the quantum observables uh, algebra. Well, what does that mean? What, what is an immediate consequence of the fact that observables uh, don't need to commute? In, in non-commuting observables cannot have all their eigenstates in uh, common. And that uh, in turn has the consequence that there will be incompatibility of certain pairs of properties in the sense that they cannot be there together. They cannot, certain eigenstates cannot be shared by uh, uh, non-commuting observables. So you can think of the classical example of the position and, uh, and momentum, but of course, in the modern literature, and which has to do with uh, the practical possibilities of testing these uh, things, there's a lot of attention for spin. And then you can think of spin components in different directions. Now, what I just said, that certain uh, properties exclude each other, cannot, cannot be there together, has an important mathematical consequence, namely that quite generally speaking, you cannot have joint probability distributions of incompatible quantities. They're just not defined within together, so to speak. They have no joint presence. And as a consequence, there can be no joint probability distribution of them. And that leads immediately to all kinds of consequences. Well, for the sake of history, I mentioned in the beginning that I will pay some attention to the historical roots of, of the things that I'm saying here. Uh, Bohr already, point, Niels Bohr already pointed out that there's a certain complementarity in quantum mechanics in the, in the sense that you cannot perform measurement operations that are represented 
by non-commuting observables, you cannot jointly perform these measurement operations. You cannot uh, simultaneously uh, measure position and momentum, for instance. And that's also reflected in the non-commutativity of the observe uh, of the Hamiltonians that you would need for those uh, different uh, operations. Then there's the famous Cauchy and Specker theorem that uh, you cannot get out of this problem by embedding the uh, non-commutative algebra in an overarching commuting structure of hidden variables. Of course, there are certain premises for that uh, proof. Uh, if, if, if you want to keep the relations that hold in quantum mechanics between commuting observables and embed them in a bigger algebra, that turns out to be impossible, which at the time when this was first uh, presented, caused a stir, whether it was really surprising. So this contextuality, it uh, is implicit in, in the equation and uh, Specker, and in this non-existence of joint probability distributions, comes back in the form of non-locality in EPR and Bell experiments. And here I have uh, an, uh, one version of that experiment. Uh, here we are discussing photons, and uh, you see a photon on the left-hand side, or, or at least there is the, after some time, because first the photons are emitted from a source, indicated by this capital S uh, here. If one photon, photon travels to the left, and one photon travels uh, to the right, and on in both wings of the experiment, there's a choice of uh, measuring one observable or another. And these two locally defined observables do not commute with each other. Now, what the Bell inequalities uh, tell you is that there cannot be a joint probability distribution of all these four quantities. So there cannot be joint values of uh, A, A prime, B, and, uh, and C. Uh, there's a general proof, which goes back to a, part, a paper by Arthur Fine in, from 1982, that obeying Bell inequalities, if, if a, an experiment, an experimental setup obeys a Bell inequality, or the results of the experiment obey a Bell inequality, that is strictly equivalent to there being a joint probability distribution. And on the other hand, the violation of Bell inequalities means that no such uh, joint probability distribution uh, exists. So we, of course, know from experiment that Bell inequalities are violated in experiments of, uh, this, kind, of this kind. And the explanation from quantum mechanics, if you just look at the mathematical structure of the quantum mechanical formalism, is exactly this, that there is no joint probability distribution. But why is that? Because these four observables do not commute with each other. But note that the non-commutativity is completely locally defined. So A doesn't commute with A prime here. B does not commute with, uh, with C. But there is no question about some kind of interference from the left to the right. So the, the, the origin, from a mathematical point of view, of the violation of uh, Bell inequalities, well, you could say, from, again, from the mathematical point of view, does not relate to spatial distance or, or non-locality. It relates to, to this non-commutative uh, structure of the uh, observables. And what the observables that don't commute are locally defined, the, 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 the A and A prime and B and C prime. And that's, of course, completely what quantum mechanics uh, tells you. You can also look at the situation from the Cauchy and Specker point of uh, view. Then we have to note that uh, A in combination with B does not commute with A in combination with, with C. That's not because of some kind of uh, non-local uh, influence of uh, disturbance traveling from left to, to right or something like that, or something like that. Now, the origin of that uh, problem, if, if you want to call it a problem, is exclusively the fact 
that uh, B does not commute with uh, C. So it's, again, it's a, it's a locally defined uh, phenomenon in the mathematical structure of, uh, of quantum mechanics, but it has the consequence that if, if, if you follow the line of argument of Cauchy and Specker, that A cannot have a fixed value irrespective of the context. So it makes a difference whether A is considered in the context of B or in the context of uh, C. So you see that also this non-locality, as it is usually uh, called, has its roots in the non-commutative structure of uh, quantum mechanics. It's, it's actually a simple consequence of that. And in the, in the quantum mechanical explanation of this uh, feature, the distance between the, uh, the, the the parties involved in the experiment doesn't play any role, actually. You can say something similar with respect to the collapse of the wave function, which of course has to do with the measurement uh, problem. If you have a state of the system that uh, is a superposition at the start, so the, I've written that down uh, here, so this is the projection operator, on state psi, and this state psi is a superposition here. And if you make a measurement on that uh, system, let's say that we find the result that's represented by one of the, the terms in the superposition, then these two projection operators on the original state and the uh, projection operator that corresponds to the result that has been found do not commute either. So you cannot attribute to the system, both fixed property having to do with the superposition and a property having to do with the measurement result. And that is the background of introducing these uh, collapses. To, so they suggest that the wave function has to change, change in the measurement. So the background of, of, of this uh, collapse idea is also uh, in the non-commutativity of the, of the algebra. And in classical mechanics, of course, this is completely different because there generally what you measure was already there in the state before you performed the measurement. So there is no incompatibility uh, there. Well, this brings us, brings us to the measurement uh, problem and, and uh, collapses. But as is well known, these collapses as, as, a, as a way out are very problematic. So one of the standard questions you can ask is what's the dividing line between measurements and the interactions? Where, where exactly do you have this collapse and where is uh, Schrodinger evolution applicable? Then we have the, the, the strange consequence that if you have a, a collapse on, in an entangled system, all the other systems must go along with this uh, collapse. And that leads to uh, super linear, luminal collapse propagation. You could uh, say a well-known uh, problem to which uh, is reflected in difficulties if you want to make uh, the collapses relativistically in invariant. And then what I myself think is, is a very important objection to the assessments of co collapses. Uh, experiments of the last 20, even 30 uh, years go in the direction of uh, actually experimentally verifying the existence of superpositions on almost a macroscopic level. And uh, the achievements uh, in this direction become more and more impressive. Things that are semi-classical, you would say, or, or semi-macroscopic, have already been demonstrated to be able to be in superposition. So that, that casts doubt on the idea that collapses are something uh, fundamental. Well, what is the reaction, the plausible reaction to this? So we would like to avoid uh, collapses. Why not stay with unitary evolution across the board? So to have Schrodinger evolution or some other unitary evolution, depending on uh, whether we are discussing relativistic quantum mechanics or non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Why not stay with unitary evolution and in this way treat measurements as ordinary physical interactions? Yes, yes, what you, just what you want and what you're used to in classical physics without collapses. And there are se several interpretations that go in that direction. So you can think of the effort interpretation. Many worlds, I will say, 
something about African to many worlds in, in the moment. Consistent histories is uh, one option. Model interpretations. The Bohm interpretation does the same. So there are no collapses in all these interpretations. But in order to do that, and to make that uh, consistent, we need to modify the idea that a physical system can only have a well-defined property if its state is an eigenstate of the associated observable. Because think back of this uh, slide that I just uh, showed you. So before the measurement, we have this superposition. After the measurement, we have uh, this, uh, this projection operator corresponding to the property that has been found, the result that has been found. Uh, if we keep fast to this, what they call eigenstate eigenvalue, so that the system can only have a property if it's in an associated uh, eigenstate, this property here, the result of the measurement, could never be present in the unitarily evolving uh, state, because that always remains a superposition. So we need some way of adapting the property attribution on the basis of states. So how should we do that? Well, there's a clue here, the canon kind of uh, historical excursion here, which you can find in an uh, old treatise, treatise by London and Bowie just before the Second World uh, War. It, it's about observation, the, uh, the process of observation in quantum mechanics. And there they consider situations in which they have an object, there's a device that couples to the object and a superposition develops. And there's also an observer that uh, comes into play and that looks at the ob ob object plus device and couples to it. So that the final state will have this uh, character in which there's a correlation between all the three parties in the experiment, the object, the device and the observer. And then Lodden and Bauer treat this, this situation from the point of view of, uh, well, unitary quantum mechanics. So they, they don't assume collapses uh, to happen. And they say there's a difference between the state for us who oversee the experiment from a distance. So we are looking at this three partite experiment, so consisting of three parties, X, Y, and Z. There's a difference between us who are looking at this experiment and parties who are involved in the experiment themselves. In this case, the observer here. For us who consider as object the combined system, X, Y, and Z, the situation seems actually the same as uh, when we were considering only an apparatus and an object. And that means that uh, there is just this uh, superposition. For, so for us, as outside observers, there is this superposition. And in principle, we could uh, perform measurements on this combined state that would show to us that indeed the superposition is uh, there. But then they continue for the observer set, the object and the apparatus, so, so these two parts of the experiment belong to his external world, to what he would call objectivity. And now there comes a, a statement that, uh, well, that is interpreted very differently by, by different commentators. Moreover, they say, the observer Z possesses the faculty of introspection, which allows him to keep track of his own state, which is the characteristic that we who oversee the experiment from distance lack in this uh, case. So what they say is that for us, who look at this state from the outside, there is one superposition. But for the observer that's in the, the, uh, the state, there is a definite result. He, by means of introspection, becomes aware of the presence of one of these uh, set possibilities corresponding to one value of, uh, of uh, i. Uh, there are I said there are different comments on this. Some people think that London and Bauer invoked consciousness here, or, the, or that this uh, betrays the, the traces of phenomenological philosophy. But my, so, so there's, discussion, there's discussion possible about these options, but my interpretation is that this is just a kind of physicist statement. And what they are proposing here 
is that the, the internal observer has a different perspective on what's happening than the outside observer. Whereas everyone agrees that uh, the unitary evolution applies. This way of interpreting the situation comes close to what effort, so that's uh, 20 years or so uh, later, proposed in his uh, thesis of 1956 and in a well known famous paper, even of 1957. So, Everett considered states of the same kind, so these uh, coupled uh, state, and he introduced the idea that with respect to Z, the state of the object plus the device, so that's the X and the Y, is relative to the state observed by Z himself. So he introduced the notion of relative states. And that fits into, I would say, with what I just explained about the London and Bauer proposal. There's a difference also in this case for us who stay outside and who describe the whole situation with the superposition and the internal observer who, uh, from his, who arguing from his perspective, attributes a property to the asset of the system that corresponds to only one of these uh, I uh, values. Now there's discussion possible uh, concerning this, whether uh, this should be interpreted in terms of uh, many worlds, so that, uh, that all these possibilities, all these different values of set are actually uh, realized in the form of parallel worlds, or whether this should be seen as uh, a proposal that they all that there are all these possibilities of which only one is real. So in the second, uh, if the second option is chosen, if, if uh, Everett actually meant to uh, propose the, the first uh, option, that's equivalent to a many worlds interpretation. If uh, this, the second option is chosen, we get into the realm of probabilistic interpretations, which have a modal aspect. So they, they, this is about possibilities of which only one is uh, realized. And actually the, the, the commentators and uh, well, let, let's say the scholars who uh, study uh, efforts text um, do not agree on this uh, point. Some say that uh, he proposed a many worlds interpretation, but if, I think a very good case can be made that he thought uh, along the lines of, of the second idea that only one of the uh, options here, for the internal point of view, that is, is actually realized. Well, but as if you as you will see, we are yet getting close to a weakness trend. But here, this is before Wigner proposed his experiment. We are here dealing with with Everett's experiment, Everett's uh, film, which look like uh, this. I, I explained most of these things already. So here we have the, the uh, object, and uh, it's a, a slight variation on uh, what I uh, what we had on the previous uh, slide. Here we have a sealed room with an object and an observer in it, and there is a second observer outside. And the whole situation can be described by a uh, superposed state, well, depending on the interactions that are, are there between the different parties uh, involved. Now, according to unitary quantum mechanics, if the internal observer makes an observation here, the state of, of the lab will be described by the superposition. But still, th that's what was implicit in the, in the proposals that I just mentioned, of Lohmann and Bauer and, uh, and Everett, we have to assume that the internal observer, let's say A, becomes aware of exactly one result. In this case, spin up or uh, spin down, because we are looking at the spin system. The spin is uh, originally horizontal, uh, is in the horizontal direction, but of course it's superposition of uh, up and down in the vertical direction. And the superposition that develops takes the observer along with this uh, superposition. But the external observer, well, it depends on, on what he's going to measure. He, he could open the room and uh, just ask, what have you seen a moment ago? And that would bring us back to a state of this kind. 
that we discussed a moment uh, before. So then there is a coupling between the external observer and what's going inside the box or inside uh, the room. But the uh, outside observer could also decide to uh, measure an observable of which the superposition inside is an eigenstate. So there are other ways of treating that, but I'm not, um, it's better not to go into that now. So you, you could also discuss in, in terms of uh, collapses, but I've already said that it's better not uh, to do so. So let's uh, look at these two options the outside observer has in the case of uh, unitary quantum mechanics. So the outside observer has uh, two choices. Well, he has many more choices, but these are the choices I would like to focus on. One option is to uh, open the box or initiate some kind of interaction by means of which he, be he, become, uh, he can become aware of the result found by the internal observer. And the other option is to make a global measurement on the whole lab and its contents that uh, checks whether or not there is a superposition. And if you write these, uh, the, the associated observables down, which I've done uh, here, they look like uh, this. O sub one is the observable that tests for the superposition and O sub two is the observable that, that tests for the uh, for, for, for the result that has been found by the internal observer, and as you can very easily check, these uh, two observables uh, don't commute with uh, with each other. So the external observer cannot do these things jointly, and as I explained in the beginning, there cannot be a joint probability distribution of this internal result and the result pertaining to the uh, uh, presence of the superposition to so the, 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 the global measurement corresponding with O1. Now, this already is more or less weakness friend experiment. Uh, so here I've called it weakness friend instead of efforts uh, friend. And you can uh, contemplate this experiment from, from various uh, directions. Of course, there is the Suggestion by Wigner himself, and also uh, slightly different by Kirai de Rimini Weber. What they have in, in common is that they assume that there is a, a collapse already in the room, and that the, and that implies that the outside observer will never be able to verify that there is a superposition. And as I said in the beginning, uh, well, the books are not closed on this proposal of this kind. But it seems highly problematic whether this will be the right way uh, to go. All experimental evidence of the last decades point in the direction that the collapse actually is there and can be uh, verified. Then, so, so I'm not going to pay attention to this uh, collapse uh, possibility. Then we have the Bohm option. Uh, the Bohm option is unitary quantum mechanics because uh, the, the wave function never collapses uh, always evolves unitarily, but it deviates from quantum mechanics because properties are not represented by uh, Hermitian operators, not by the usual quantum mechanical observables. And uh, uh, only possession is assumed as a property. And, and well, I, I suppose you know how it uh, works. Uh, if, if you think about the systems as consisting of particles having positions, what you will find in a situation of this kind is that the positions will be lo located in only one branch of the total uh, wave uh, function, and the other branch is uh, empty. The outside, so there's only one result actually realized inside of the closed sealed uh, room. But still, the wave function is, uh, is a superposition. And uh, that has consequences for the things that uh, the, the outside observer, Wigner in this case, will be able to measure. And the results are exactly as, uh, the, as other variations of unitary quantum mechanics. Wigner will be able to verify that the total wave function is, is in a superposition, even 
though the internal situation is one in which only one option was uh, realized. But in this picture, well, we, we, we don't have the, uh, uh, the no code theorems which forbid the presence of uh, joint probabilities because all these things can be there together, these particle uh, positions. But, but that has a price. And what we have to introduce here are non-local interactions where the story is uh, well known. And that uh, has also consequences for the compatibility of this scheme with relativity theory, which, which is a bit uh, problematic. So let's go to other interpretations, unitary interpretation. Uh, many worlds. In the many world interpretation, the internal observer makes her measurement. And then the result is a splitting of the situation. Uh, we find after the measurement one Alice left over. Uh, seeing spin up and another Alice seeing spin down. And now, but, but now there's an interesting uh, point that, that comes from considering this experiment. What we see is that it cannot be the case that this splitting of the world extends outside of the box. Because if that were the case, and if uh, Wigner himself would be carried along in this uh, splitting, so, so would be part of splitting, and so would end up in either one world one of Alice's or the other, uh, he, he would never be able to measure a, a superposition, whereas we assume, and the uh, empirical evidence uh, goes in that uh, direction, that it is possible for the outside observer to measure this uh, superposition. So, so we find here the result that uh, a measurement, in, internal measurement in the, in the room has the consequence of uh, splitting the, the, the situation in, in two copies, but it's not a splitting that extends to the whole universe. And that already is, is an interesting result of considering this, this Wigner experiment, because in, in much, in, anyway, in much of the older literature about uh, the many worlds interpretation, uh, it's presented like, like a global splitting that extends to the whole universe or the whole universe. Uh, uh, ends up in the, being in, in several copies. That, that cannot be the case if, uh, if what I'm saying is uh, true. So what we find is that for the external observer, there are two worlds inside. And so there's no definite measurement uh, uh, result. But for Alice, there is a definite measurement result, result in the sense that there are two Alice's, of course, and each one of them sees exactly one result. Uh, that, let's go uh, on. The time is uh, guessing. Well, now I, I come to uh, uh, this uh, analysis of the situation from the point of view of one world, single world unitary schemes. And I think that's something that in uh, actual physical practice is very often in the back of people's mind, although they never explore all the consequences of this of this uh, option. So cubism is one of the options here, relational quantum mechanics. That's what uh, Rovelli has been proposing for a rather long time. And uh, several model interpretations of which uh, Olympia Lombardi is, is one of the proponents and I myself have also done work in, in that. So that's a, a unitary scheme in which there's one world. And so that means if you compare that with uh, efforts original ideas, that this splitting is not seen so as uh, a splitting of the world in, in different really existing parallel universes of, of parallel rooms in, in our case, but it's rather seen as a splitting in different possibilities of which one is, uh, is actual. Well, if you go that way, uh, we, you have to take into account uh, the, the non-existence of uh, a joint probability. There is a certain result here. Uh, the, the outside observer also has a result. Uh, if, if he, uh, let's say that the outside observer measures the superposition, these two things, as we have argued before, cannot be there together. And that suggests, in the, in the spirit of effort and London Bauer, that we have to make a difference 
between the properties that are internal to the room and, and the properties that are external. And another way of saying this is that the properties assume a perspectival character. There are certain properties from W's point of view, and they don't need to be compatible with properties from A's point of view. So that's the suggestion that, uh, well, imposes itself on us if we want to interpret uh, this uh, the, the, uh, unitary scheme for experiments of this uh, kind in the context of one world. And you could perhaps say that this perspectival character of properties that's introduced here is the single world way of dealing with what in the many worlds interpretation is the existence of, of par parallel worlds next to each uh, other. Well, this ties in, and this is a kind of philosophical uh, note with uh, developments in analytical philosophy, analytical met metaphysics of the last couple of years. There's a, a proposal by Kit Fine from 2005, and there's another young philosopher of science with the name of Lipman, who has done a lot of recent work on this. If it's the following scheme is proposed, they say, well, we shouldn't think of the world as being kind of monolithic whole, in which each thing has its absolute properties and the whole this description of the whole is just composed of all these descriptions of the properties of, of, the, of the single uh, elements, constituents of that uh, world. No, rather, the world should be seen as a collection of what they call fragments. And each fragment contains mutually compatible facts, but different fragments are incompatible with each other. And all these fragments are equally real and objective. And the, the whole of reality, the total reality, is formed by the collection of all such uh, fragments. And in our case, and I, so, so the, the examples that they give, uh, refer to relativity theory, and I, actually I don't think these examples are very good, but in this case, I think there's something to be said for this, because these fragments could could be associated with perspectives of the, in the way that I uh, try to explain it. So the pers in, 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 in the concrete, concrete case at hand, the perspective of the external observer forms one fragment in this relational metaphysics, and the internal observer's perspective would define another fragment, namely the fragment in which the spin is either up or down, whereas in the outsider's perspective, the whole, the property with which you should describe the, uh, the room is a superposition. And uh, that means that uh, A doesn't have a definite outcome. Now, my three, so I'm more or less on time, I think. Uh, a brief comment on uh, the discussion which is going on on, on, on situations of this uh, kind. Here's a uh, recent paper by Bong, Calvacanti, and, and, and others. A strong no code theorem on the weakness friend paradox. And that's a kind of uh, bell version of the um, weakness friend in which you have these uh, two sealed rooms, but they are in an entangled state with respect to what's in uh, inside. And uh, so there is an internal observer in, in two rooms who makes an experiment. And the outside observer can choose between two non-commuting observables. It's very similar to the traditional Bell experiment. And uh, what, these people, what, what is shown here is that the, uh, the quantum predictions pictures of, of quantum mechanics, contradict the existence of a joint probability of all the four observables that I uh, play in this uh, experiment. Uh, I myself think that that's interesting. And of, 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 of course, it's very nice to, uh, to have these results uh, available, but I don't think it teaches us anything new compared to the original Bell experiments, I think the, the, this non-existence of the joint probabilities can already be argued for in the case of the, the, the single room, 
just because of the non-commutability of the observables that are involved. Well, that brings me finally to my conclusion that you already have seen, <laughs> I'm afraid. So what I've been arguing for in this uh, little presentation is that the core novelty of quantum theory, and which is responsible for, for, for all the strange things, is a non-commutative structure of the algebra of observables. And that leads, this non-commutativity leads to no code results concerning joint existence of physical properties. And it also leads to the measurement uh, problem. And uh, if, you, if you want to make sense of this and get out of the conceptual difficulties uh, offered to, uh, caused by this, then I, th I think that the possibility suggests itself of taking unitary quantum mechanics seriously. So do without collapse, always unitary evolution, but interpret the, uh, the superposed state in a new way. Uh, and I, I think it's possible to go into the direction of perspectival properties in which you have a layered description of reality in which there are different perspectives. Which in, in, and in the different perspectives, you can make statements that uh, contradict the statements in, in the other perspectives. And well, but that's just what you expect if the properties are relational. And I, I would say that the simple weak and friend case illustrates these ideas well. And that's so even without recently proposed uh, extensions, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis, for this wonderful talk. So now we open the space for questions. I read the chat and Olympia has a question. Please, Olympia, go on. Olympia should switch on her phone, her microphone. Oh, yeah. Hi. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Very clear. I, I, I agree almost in, in almost everything you say because you know that uh, I agree with uh, your uh, model view. Um, and I, first, a, a little um, uh, comment about the bong, the last, uh, the last. Uh, um, oh. uh, the derivation of new uh, inequalities that Bong and, and Altri, this very recent. I think that there is something, I mean, it's nothing new, nothing, nothing very new, but it is something that is interesting because they relax it a little bit. They only required parameter in independence, but That's they true. didn't ask outcome independence. So they relax it. The, uh, the requirements. So, if you violate uh, the the the, uh, um, the inequalities, I mean the, the the result is stronger just because it, the requirements are relaxed. No, so I think that this this is I found the, the paper very interesting for that reason. Of course, uh, there is no. Nothing new. I mean, in the sense that uh, we are not expecting to to find something that uh, uh, makes uh, quantum mechanics commutative or something like this. I mean, it's, it was expected like this that result. But I think that the the proposal is interesting because they are relaxing one of the requirements of the original Bell Bell um, experiment or or proposal. <clears throat> no, no, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. So, yeah, perhaps I should have mentioned uh, that. Yeah, that, that's yeah. Uh, true. That's true. Yeah. yeah and I, I, that, have, I have to think a little bit further on it, whether this can also be transposed to the original Bell experiment. Well, I have to think about it. But, but th thank you for this remark. Yeah, it, it certainly is true that uh, the, they premise, their premises are a little bit weaker. Than the usual yeah. uh, ones, yeah. yes. But that's well, true. but this was a, a comment. What I, I think that is interesting is that, uh, that during the last times I was thinking about um, your per perspective that is very, very relational, or like uh, Rovelli's one, very relational, and the people saying that they, this can be made uh, compatible with uh, ontological ontics structure 
structural realism, uh, Ladyman and, and all these people. And uh, on the other hand, my interpretation assigns properties that are not relational to close to, to quantum systems. So it seems that it's very, this cannot be made uh, compatible. Nevertheless, I think that they can. Uh, instead of this, uh, all people discuss and say, my, my, my uh, interpretation is better than yours, but I, I try to do something different that is try to see how different interpretations can combine and make, and, and make a, 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 a richer, picture because the relational views uh, apply to open systems, systems that are, are in interaction that so you can like the, the uh, examples you, you give you gave. So you have a system interacted with another system and you have a, a correlation between observables. And my view is a view from the closed system. So I think that the both um, views can be made not only compatible, but combined because they give descri descriptions from different viewpoints. From the viewpoint of the uh, uh, closed system, you can have certain properties well-defined. And from the viewpoint of the open systems inside, all properties are rela re relational to the other system. And, um, and I think that there is no problem in the, for a metaphysical view, structuralist, because you can have relations and properties. I mean, people insist that uh, relational views, all, everything is, are, everything is relation. Why? You, a structure can have relations and properties. So I think that there is no uh, contradiction. And it's, it's a, uh, an idea that is going around in my head since some time. So I, 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 I'm going to, I want to give you the, this just to see we can think together. No, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Olympia. And I'm much interested in, in the things that you uh, say. Uh, so, of course, I, I, I agree with the fact that you can have relations next to uh, absolute monadic uh, properties. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit wondering, but I have to look into the details concerning this, how to deal with uh, these ex friend situations in, in your scheme. If, if all the properties are absolute, there seems to be a problem with uh, the existence of joint uh, probabilities. If, if the things are just there together, you always have a joint probability distribution. But th those are, are, are not admitted allowed by quantum mechanics. You, you can, if you try to do something like you, you get negative probabilities. But, no, no, you can. But you I have can, to look at it. You can com, 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 you can compute um, uh, pro uh, conditional probabilities. And if you compute the, con like uh, in the case of, of we have done this in consecutive measurements. And if you look at the whole system, you can find that the conditional probabilities are the right, are, are what expect. I mean, you will not have different values in the, in the two measurements. So, and the same can be can be done in the case of of a uh, um, of a big net. Of course, if you want to talk about the precise properties inside uh, of the system alone, you need to take your view. But from the viewpoint of the complete uh, 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 system, the closed system, you only can uh, uh, compute conditional probabilities. Uh -huh. I think that it, it's possible, right? We can we can discuss that. Yeah, we should uh, follow up on this uh, by email or something like that. Yes. 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 Of course. <laughs> <laughs> this is okay. something like an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. The, sorry for interrupt, but th there are two more questions. If you want, I can just read them both, and then Dennis, you can give a 
perhaps a short yeah. reply to them. So one question is by Fernando Lemog, and he says, do you think that Renner's paradox adds anything new to the discussion or is it just the same? And the other questions come from Gabriel Bengochea. He says that how can initial symmetries disappear in the early universe where we have no available observables in the framework of, of an evolution given by unitary quantum mechanics? And he says, another related question will be, how can quantum fields present at the beginning of the universe without observers present obtain defined values within the single word universal uh, unitary quantum mechanics framework? Yeah, well, I think that those are two completely different questions. Uh, yes. So the first about uh, Friaghi and, and Renner, I, I, I think their experiment is, is just a kind of complicated version of the, the experiment that I had in this Bong case. And, and, and the solution to, to, to their paradox, as far as I can see, is that uh, well, they assume the joint presence of all the, 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 the values there, but that, that, that's forbidden by quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what they do at a certain point is, so, so there are two rooms and, and the internal point of view by, by one internal observer is translated to another observer's perspective. And that cannot be done. I think that has been commented on in the literature already. So I think it's just a version of, of, of this kind of experiment that I just on. And the other thing uh, about the observers, yes, perhaps I, I have been a, a bit uh, rather loose with, with, with using the term observer. I, I, I don't mean a human observer or, 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 or something having consciousness or, or something like that. No, it's just an interaction between physical systems and even and so this scheme of, of uh, attributing properties should work even if there are no observers in the usual human sense available. So as soon as you have two or more systems in interaction with each other, and you can you can, you can write down these uh, superpositions, then then this scheme of property attribution should uh, work. And even in the early universe, there were well different particles and systems that interact with each other. And well, I. <laughs> I, I, uh, very, very difficult subject in itself, of course, but so loosely speaking, it, it, uh, it, it's, it's to, the, the schemes should still work uh, even there. That, that's what I would say. Okay, Dennis, uh, thanks for your wonderful talk and answering the questions. We are a little bit out of time now, so we should be closing this morning session. So we, we give some claps, internet claps again for you. And thank you for being here. Thank you all the speakers today. So now we are cutting the transmission and returning at two o'clock. Remember that all the times is played in the program relate to Argentina time. So you have to be careful about us. So now two o'clock Argentina time, we return the transmission. And remember that in order to enter in the the Zoom links, you have it on, you receive that by email in a PDF where you, can, you must click on the, on the Zoom link of the session that you want to enter. And there's been a slight change in the program. At, uh, we, instead of having Professor Katicha later today, we have switched places with uh, Eloisa Cuestas, and she will speak today instead of Professor Ariel Katicha, and uh, Ariel will speak on Friday. So see you later this i hope to see you all later this afternoon and thanks to all the speakers again for the wonderful talks